Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is a story about what if Kanoha begs Naruto to return harem. Before I start, please support for more amazing content and do consider subscribing to my channel and share this video with your friends. This is written by Chidori Iso and link in the description and support writer. Let's start the video. Chapter 1. A New Beginning. The sky was darkened by clouds, the terrain was torn up, and a tempest was brought down upon the waters. Overall, the valley of the end now looked like hell. The cause of said destruction were two young shinobi who were just bringing their battle to a close. Each currently stood at the feet of the great statues that reside in the valley. At the foot of Hashirama Senju stood a blonde boy clad in an orange jumpsuit. His eyes were a fiery red that complemented the angry scowl he wore. His body was blanketed in menacing red chakra that took the shape of a fox. He was battered and bruised all over, and his left arm hung limply at his side. The air around him was filled with rage and hatred. He was glaring at his opponent. Across the way, the other boy stood at the base of Madara Che. He wore a high-collared blue shirt and white shorts. His skin was a sickly gray, his hair was now long and pale indigo in color, and a black four-point star rested on the bridge of his nose. His bright red eyes held three tomo each that circled his eyes. Most would recognize this as the Achiha clan Sharingan, one of the three legendary Ninjutsu. A pair of demonic wings sprouted from his back. The air around him was filled with anger and arrogance. He too was glaring at the boy across from him. At first sight, they would look like the greatest of enemies. But in reality, they were the best of friends. One was seeking to flee their village in search of power to defeat his elder brother, while the other was trying to prevent that from happening. The winged boy began forming hand signs and lightning sparked to life in his left hand that quickly turned black due to the seal on the back of his neck. The sound of birds chirping echoed throughout the valley. At the same time, the orange boy formed a blue sphere of chakra in his right hand that turned purple from the influence of the demonic shroud. You could hear the surge of power that emanated from the sphere after it was formed. After sending each other one final glare, they leapt at each other, intending to end their long, drawn-out struggle. The orange boy put everything he had into his technique. He had to bring his friend back no matter the cost, even if it left him knocking at death's door. Everyone was counting on him. Now was his chance to prove to everyone that was wasn't that incompetent idiot or demon that they made him out to be. Most of all, he made a promise to the girl of his dreams. Even if she didn't return his feelings, he would bring the Achiha back because it would make her happy, and that was good enough for him. The Achiha used the last of his power for his attack. He had to leave to village to obtain the necessary strength to eliminate his traitorous brother. But the blonde didn't seem to understand that and was intent on stopping him. Much to his displeasure, he figured the only way he would be able to walk away for good was to kill his friend. He didn't want to, but he left him no choice. Killing his brother and avenging his clan were his goals in life, goals that he would fulfill. Time seemed to slow as they closed the distance between them. The valley grew quiet as the end drew closer to one another. It all came down to this. This would end it all. This final clash would settle their rivalry once and for all. One final breath was drawn as they met in midair. A Sengen. The blonde boy yelled shooting his good arm forward, putting all put his emotion into his attack, in hopes of getting through to his friend. Jidori. The Achiha shouted thrusting his hand in front of him, putting his everything into his attack in hopes of severing his last eyes to the village. The powerful techniques met in an abrupt stalemate. The air and excess chakra that each gave off swirled around them from the force of the attacks. The chakras mixed and from a dark cocoon of energy around the boys. The Achiha's hand was inches away from the blonde's heart. Instead of piercing it with the remnants of his Chidori, he formed a fist at the last second and delivered a forceful punch, knocking him out. The blonde, feeling himself lose consciousness, swung at the Achiha's head, leaving a scratch on his forehead protector. The black dome of energy expanded to massive proportions and disrupted the flow of the waterfall behind it. Reaching the apex of its growth, the dome began glow brightly. The white light intensified until eventually enveloping the entire area in a bright flash. As the water settled and the light faded, the results of the previous battle became clear. The blonde lay silently on the ground at the foot of the Achiha who stood over him hunched over. Sasu couldn't bring himself to kill Naruto. He knew that in doing so he would obtain the eyes that his brother spoke of and give him unimaginable power, but killing his best friend was something he just couldn't do. He would not stoop to Itachi's level. Instead, he would gain power through his own methods. He looked down at the blonde that slept peacefully at his feet. He was out cold and barely breathing, but alive nonetheless. He was indeed strong and Sasuke acknowledged that, but there were two things that confused him. First was the mysterious red chakra that appeared during their fight. The only other times he had experienced such strong killer intent was the night Itachi left and the time they ran into Orochimaru in the forest of death during the Chiknin exams. Only this time it was different. It was not only menacing, but demonic as well. He never knew the happy-go-lucky loud mouth was capable of something. 
The second was why Naruto continued to fight for a village that obviously hated him. From what he saw everyone outside of Kakashi Sensei, Haruka Sensei, a few select ninja and even the Hokage herself, despised the boy's very existence. Even his long-time crush and teammate didn't give him the time of day. It was obvious by the way she beat him senseless across the head that she clearly resented the blonde. Maybe that's the reason for his dimwittedness. Even when they were younger, he had witnessed on occasion the beatings and resentment the younger boy endured. He knew Naruto was an orphan, so at first he believed that his parents must have done something that really pissed off the villagers. But he dismissed that when he heard some of the adults call Naruto a demon. Naruto was obnoxious, loud, annoying, hyperactive, and a pain at times. The list goes on, but one thing for sure was that Naruto was not a demon. He was too happy and energetic for such a title. It must have something to do with that red chakra. If it had been him, he would have abandoned the village long ago. But Naruto didn't, he stayed. He stayed and became a ninja and protector for those who resented him. He even had the gall to declare that he would rule over them by becoming Hokage one day. And he persevered through it all with a smile on his face. It obviously had to be a mask, a way to hide his true emotions. There's no way someone can go through a childhood like that and not be affected. And now Naruto lay motionless on the cold rocky ground of the valley. Any nearby shinobi were bound to have felt the massive spike in energy and were probably on their way to investigate. He would be long gone by then and if they were leaf ninja, all they would find was Naruto's unconscious form and take him back to that hellish experience that he called life. Sasuke wouldn't let that happen. He could not let his only true friend return to such a horrid lifestyle. Gathering all of his remaining strength, he carefully hoisted Naruto's limp body off the ground and onto his back. After taking a while to adjust to the extra weight, Sasuke began to walk, or at least he tried. It was more of a trudge. That last battle left him completely exhausted, and having to carry Naruto was putting more stress on his already strained body. He stopped and winced when he felt a wave of pain shoot through him. The curse mark on his neck was pulsing and seemed to be the source. But Sasuke pushed through it. He had two for both his and Naruto's sake. He would be damned if he had to return to the hidden leaf. They would have him under constant watch, and then he would never gain the power to face Itachi, that's if he ever had the chance, and Naruto would once again be submerged in a world of pain, loneliness, and hatred. Slowly but surely, he reached the edge of the valley. At this point, it began to rain. It was subtle at first, but it quickly began to pick up, pelting the young boys. Taking a deep breath and shifting Naruto's body on his back to better accommodate him, Sasu continued his snail's pace through the forest towards the lair of Orochimaru. Akashi felt the large spike in chakra a few minutes ago and was currently en route alongside Pakin to investigate. With any luck, he would find his two pupils and they would all be able to safely return to the hidden leaf. He still couldn't believe Sasuke left the village. He knew the boy was obsessed with gaining power, but he never thought he would seek out someone like Rachimaru. He had to bring him back no matter what. Sasuke was the last Ichiha besides his brother and he had made a silent bow to himself to look after the boy for Ibido's sake. The Kashi soon arrived at the Valley of the End and landed upon the head of Hashirama Senju. He surveyed the destruction that he deduced had to be the result of the power surge he felt moments before. Seeing no sign of his charges, he jumped down to the water below. He notices the holes in the ankles of both statues and he could feel some of the excess chakra that still resided. It was menacing and demonic. It sent a chill down his spine. Despite this, he still saw no sign of Naruto and Sasuke. Akin do you still have their scent? He asked the small pug. Pakin raised his nose and began sniffing the air. He swiveled his head making sure to cover the entire valley. But he couldn't pick up any human sense other than Kakashi's. I'm sorry Kakashi, but it seems the rain has washed away all traces of their presence. All I know for sure is that they were both definitely here, Pakin replied. Kakashi was in disbelief. Not only had he lost two of his students, they just happened to be the only remnants of his best friend's clan and his sensei. He could no longer keep his promise to look after the last Ichiha. No longer could he watch over his sensei's only son. He was ashamed and felt like he had let them down. But suddenly he caught a glint out of the corner of his eye. He walked over to investigate and found a leaf headband with a single scratch going across the middle of the forehead protector. This was the sign of a missing nin. He picked it up and held in front of Pakin, in hopes of gaining some kind of lead. Akin sniffed the cloth that was held in front of his nose. It's Asuk's, but I can't pick up his or Naruto's scent anywhere. I'm sorry Kakashi. The silver-haired Jimnin was saddened to hear this. It was official now. His charges were forever lost. At least for now that is. All he could do now was return to the village and inform the Hokage of the situation. Pocketing Sasuke's headband, he turned to the small pug next to him. Come on Pakin, we must inform Tsunade-sama. With that, both left away and began the long journey back to Konoha. Somewhere far off, Naruto was beginning to return to the world of living. He found himself in a warm bed. It was a little stiff, but still comforting nonetheless. 
He sat up slowly holding his head while trying to remember what happened before he blacked out. That's right. I was fighting Sasuke in the Valley of the End. I countered his Shidori with my Rasengan, but everything after that is fuzzy. Naruto took a minute to gaze over his surroundings. He was in a dark room with the only source of light being three small candles on the table next to him. Where the hell am I? He thought aloud. Before he had more time to muse over the situation, he heard a small click and the sound of hinges groaning. A door directly across from him opened slowly letting some light from the hallway outside. A slender figure made his way to the bed. Naruto immediately took a defensive position as best he could. He was in an unfamiliar atmosphere, and he wasn't exactly sure if the figure was friendly or not. A shadowy figure approached the bed that Naruto was resting in. Naruto eased up a little when he made out the womanly figure. Surely she could offer some sort of explanation as to what was going on. The woman chuckled. Naruto paled. The last time he heard that dark perverted chuckle he nearly died. His fears were confirmed when light finally caught the figure's body and revealed a sickly white man with golden snake-like eyes. Arachimaru, Naruto growled. Gukuku it seems you have finally awakened Naruto-kun. Naruto immediately began forming a plan escape plan. Molding chakra, he quickly placed his hand in the cross seal. Shadow clone jutsu. He called out. But instead of copies of him spawning into existence, he felt a sharp pain course throughout his body, and he doubled over. Arachimaru let out another chuckle. Naruto growled in frustration. What the hell is this? Gukuku I see you've noticed. You're completely powerless Naruto-kun. What did you do to me you pedophile? The SKTSK such foul language. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all, Arachimaru grinned as he formed the serpent hand sign. Naruto immediately cringed when he felt another wave of pain wash over him. He cried out in agony. What did you do to me you bastard? Naruto panted. I simply sealed of access to your chakra. As you've noticed, trying to mold it brings forth a nasty shock instead. If you're a good boy then I might let you have it back. So you kidnapped one while I was unconscious. Shows how strong you are. Can't even beat a lowly gen in fair and square. Naruto barked. This sent Orochimaru into a tirade of laughter. Naruto was far from amused. Kidnap you? Ha I could care less about a punk like you. Sasu-kun arrived here carrying you on his back. Your presence here came as much as a shock to you as it did to me. But since I have you, I figure I might as well keep you, the pale man chuckled. You're lying. Sasu tried to escape from me. Why would you bring me here? I have no reason to lie you impudent child. Sasuke's the one that brought you here and I don't believe it or not. But believe this, you won't be leaving anytime soon. The snake man roared. Oh yeah? Just you wait, Hiro Senen will find me and I'll be out of here in no time. I can't wait to see the look on your face after he kicks your ass. Orochimaru's patience had worn thin with the boy. He reformed the serpent sign and watched as the Naruto convulsed in pain. He turned around and spoke one final time as he left the room. HMPH we'll see about you damn brat. If I so wish it, you'll be stuck here forever. With that, the door slammed and Naruto was left alone once again. He slowly sat up after finally recovering from Orochimaru's jutsu. His body ached, his head was spinning, and he was panting like a sick animal. Sasuke brought me here. But why he pondered to himself. His thoughts suddenly shifted to Konoha. Achan will send someone to search for me. And even if she doesn't, Hiro Senen will come here and rescue me for sure. At least I hope they do Naruto's thoughts turn sullen as he kept pondering about being rescued. Who am I kidding? No one cares about me. They're probably happy I'm gone. I bet right now they're celebrating that the demon finally left the village. Kakashi went straight to the Hokage's office when he arrived back in Konoha. He had to tell her of Naruto and Sasuke's status immediately. When he arrived, he was informed that Tsunade was taking care of urgent business at the hospital, so he set out the new destination. Upon arriving, he asked a nurse where to find the Hokage who informed him that she was in an operating room in ICU. When he came upon said room, he found Shikamaru and the blonde girl from Suna sitting outside of the door. Shikamaru was a mess. This was his first mission as squad leader, and it ended in utter failure. Both Shinjai and Niji were on the verge of death, Kiba and Lee were banged up, and there was no sign of Naruto. If the Suna trio hadn't shown up then they all would have died. He was so busy berating himself that he almost didn't notice Kakashi walking up. He stood up and faced the silver-haired Jinin, hoping he had news on his blonde friend's whereabouts. Kakashi-sensei have you seen Naruto? He hasn't returned yet, and no one's seen him since he ran ahead to face Sasuke. Kakashi hung his head. He didn't know how exactly to tell the boy he couldn't find his student. Shikamaru noticed his hesitance and feared the worst. Just then, Tsunade came out of the operating room and sighed tiredly. Shikamaru was the first to engage her. Tsunade saw Mahao's Chinjai. He asked her hysterically. Tsunade sighed again as she rubbed her stiff neck. He's stable. I was able to concoct an antidote using the notes your father gave me. Tell him he has my thanks. As for Chinjai, he's really weak and needs rest. 
With a couple weeks rest and a stable diet, he'll be back on his feet in no time. Shikamaru was glad to hear the good news, so much in fact that he sat back down and cried. The three others in attendance looked at him sympathetically. Kakashi quickly redirected his attention to the Hokage. Tsunade Sama we need to talk. It's about Naruto. She immediately motioned for him to follow her around the corner. She had been worried sick about the little loud mouth ever since she heard that he didn't return with the rest of the group. She had been praying for his safety ever since. Alright Kakashi spill it, she commanded as they rounded the corner. Kakashi let out a sigh as he gathered his thoughts. She definitely was not going to like what he had to say. I was searching for Naruto and Sasuke with Pakin when we felt a massive spike in energy. We made our way toward the disturbance and arrived at the Valley of the End. Upon inspection, I found the result of catastrophic battle, but there was no one around. The only thing I found was Sasuke headband, he said pulling out the tattered cloth. Unfortunately, the rain washed away all scents lingering in the area. That's where our trail went cold and is the last confirmed location of Naruto and Sasuke, he finished. He stared curiously at the blonde woman. She hadn't said anything or yelled out like he had thought she would. She instead just stood there looking deep in thought. After a few moments of silence, Tsunade spoke. Thank you Kakashi. I suggest you inform Sakura of the situation. You're to remain on standby till further notice. Dismissed. Kakashi nodded and shunshined away to find his pink-haired charge. Tsunade herself shunshined back to her office and plopped down in her chair. All her composure left her as tears streamlined down her cheeks. Naruto, the only reason she came back to be Hokage in the first place, was gone. She wasn't sure if he had been kidnapped, defected, or if he was even still alive. The thought of not knowing was unbearable. She was too distracted to notice the strong pair of arms wrap around her. That's when the floodgates broke. She began to sob uncontrollably as she embraced Jiraiya. He had returned to the village a short while ago and snuck in through the window, only to find the distraught Hokage. What's wrong Tsunade Haim? He asked, wondering what could have happened to bring her to tears like that. He's gone Jiraiya he disappeared and we can't find him. She cried. Who's gone? He asked rubbing her back. Naruto. Jiraiya's mood dropped at that. Tsunade what do you mean he's gone? What happened? Sasuke Chiha left the village three days ago, and I sent to the team of Shikamaru Nara, Chimjai Akimichi, Niji Haika, Kiba Inuzuka, and Naruto to retrieve him. According to a report from Shikamaru, Naruto went ahead to confront Sasuke, and that was the last time he was seen. Kakashi arrived at the Valley of the End sometime later, which he confirmed was the boy's last known location. She managed to choke out in between sobs. Urea stood there and digested the information just delivered to him. Tsunade on the other hand began to cry even harder as her thoughts from earlier came back full force. He could be in trouble Jiraiya. What if he's hurt and can't make it back? Or got kidnapped? What if he defected? What if what if he's dead? It's okay Tsuhaim, he cooed softly the fox will heal any wounds he sustains, and I highly doubt he ran away. He cares about the village too much. How can you be so sure Jiraiya? You know what his childhood was like. What if he finally had enough and snapped? She argued. He was taken aback by her outburst. What she said was true. What if Naruto did get fed up with the villagers and left? It was very well a possibility and he couldn't say he would be surprised much if it that were the case. They treated Minato's last and only legacy with such malice and hatred, the exact opposite of what he wanted. Ureya continued to stroke Tsunade's back lovingly as she cried into his chest, while his thoughts drifted to his latest blonde pupil. Naruto where are you? Six months. Six long months were spent looking of Naruto and Sasuke. Tsunade had argued with the council to give her some time to search for Naruto, since it was unknown whether he left willingly or not. Unfortunately they couldn't come up with any leads. Kakashi and his Ninkan came back empty-handed every time, and even Jiraiya's spy network couldn't get a fix on the missing blonde. The best trackers in the Inuzuka clan swept over the whole valley of the end and could not pick up a scent on the boy. Their only surefire way of finding the Naruto was by obtaining a Bikmch, a rare bug said to be able to track anyone or thing, no matter where it is, as long its scent was the first thing it smelled after metamorphosis into an adult. Tsunade had sent teammate to retrieve it, but unfortunately it ended in failure after it was taken from them by members of Iwa's bug user clan, the Kamizuru, after they threatened Hinata's life. So without any leads as to the blonde boy's location, Tsunade was forced to make a decision that she would regret. She tried to stall for time, but the council was very firm in their judgment. So now she found herself in her office with all of Naruto's friends and their respective sensei, Hiruka, and Kakashi. Jiraiya stood just behind her for moral support. Well since everyone's here it's now or never I guess she told herself. I'm glad that all of you could make it today. I have very important news to share with you, though I'm sure some of you won't like it, Tsunade began. What this about Hokage-sama? Niji asked. It's about Naruto. Gasps erupted randomly around the room. Tsunade-sama has he finally been found. What about Sasuke-kun? 
Sakura asked, voice full of hysteria. I'm sorry no. As you all know, roughly six months ago a team lead by Shikamarinara embarked on a mission to retrieve Sasuke Chiha after he fled the village. That mission ended in failure, and everyone but Naruto returned home. She replied. Shikamaru hung his head in shame at the mention of his failed mission. Naruto was last confirmed to be with Sasuke before he suddenly disappeared. We speculate that the two are together but are unsure if he was forced or left willingly. The past six months have been sent trying to get a fix on the boy's location, but every attempt was in vain. I tried to buy more time and I'm afraid I can't hold it off any longer. As of today, both Naruto Uzumaki and Sasuke Chiha are declared missing men. Sakura did her best to hold back tears. She couldn't believe her ears. Both of her teammates had just been declared missing men. First Sasuke Kun left and then the dope went right after him. She felt hurt and abandoned. Her resolve broke and she began to sob into the shoulder of her best friend Ino. Inada herself was on the verge of crying. Naruto Kun, her longtime crush and the one person she admired the most, was now gone forever. He would now be hunted down and possibly killed by his fellow comrades. She felt like a part of her left with him. She was her inspiration in life, the driving force behind her newfound courage and strength, the reason she woke up with a smile every morning. And now he was no more. The rest of the Konoha Eleven was in a state of shock and disbelief. Naruto was a lot of things, but he certainly wasn't a traitor. Lee was the first to voice his objections. Tsunade Sama surely there has been a mistake. Naruto Kun's flames of youth burn too greatly with passion towards the village to commit such an unyouthful act. We must find him and bring him back to the safety of the village. And if we cannot then I will run 500 laps around Konoha every day until we do so. No, I'm sorry. The decision is final. Naruto is an enemy of the state now and will be treated as such. Should he be found and captured, he will be returned to Konoha to stand trial, Tsunade answered the green-clad boy. Trial? He hasn't done anything wrong Hokage-sama. We all know Naruto is mischievous, but he doesn't have an evil bone in his body. For all we know, he is being held by the enemy somewhere and need rescuing. We must act fast to find him. Shikamaru uncharacteristically yelled. I'm sorry Shikamaru, but there is nothing else I can do for him, Tsunade replied sternly. Underneath her professional demeanor, she was actually in pain. It hurt her too much to have to say those words. Inada couldn't take it anymore. Her grief was too overwhelming and she darted out of the office. Kiba, Shino, and Kurinai were hot on her trail. They had to find and console the hurting Bluenet. That is all I have to say, you are all dismissed, Tsunade commanded. Everyone else in the room, albeit some reluctantly, filed out of her office. Sakura took some extra help from Kakashi and Ino to get her to leave. She was an emotional wreck. After everyone but Jureya had left, Tsunade slammed her fists on the desk, and tears began to stream down her cheeks. She just made one of the hardest decisions ever since she became Hokage, and she didn't enjoy it. Jureya stood behind her and just stared out of the window. He let his former teammate cry and release all of her built of guilt. After a few minutes, her voice brought his attention back to the room. Jureya I have a mission for you, she said, wiping the last remnants of tears off her face. What is it Suhaim? He asked. She turned around to face him and met his dark eyes with her reddening hazel ones. Jurei I want you to find Naruto. I don't care what you have to do as long as it doesn't cause political fallout, but I want you to find him and bring him back no matter the cost. Jurei nodded understanding the task given unto him. I planned on doing that anyway. The little gaki can't get rid of us that easily. Soon he'll be back annoying people and wreaking havoc throughout the village in no time. He said assuming Guy's infamous nice guy pose. Sunade smiled and her spirits were lifted a little. If anyone could find the boy it would be Jiraiya. She turned her thoughts to said blonde praying for his safety. Naruto wherever you are, I hope you're safe and return home to us one day. Naruto sat in his bed staring at the wall across from him. He had done this every day for the last seven months he had been held in captivity. He pondered on thoughts of his life up to now. It's not like there was much else to do. He felt he had gotten strong but not enough to earn the respect of those around him. And with him being stuck in the perverted snake's clutches, he wouldn't be able to fulfill his dream of becoming Hokage. Speaking of Hokage, he began to think of the elderly woman. He was sure that Bachan would have sent out someone to find him by now, or at least he hoped she did. He considered her, Shizun Nichin, Iro Senen, and Aruka Sensei to be the closest thing he had to a family, and he only hoped that they felt the same way about him. Surely they had to be concerned about his absence. But alas, Naruto was bored out of his mind. He couldn't leave the room and since there wasn't much to do in there he just laid in bed all day. He rarely got visitors other than the guard who brought him food and this strange reteated girl with glasses named Karen. She was ordered to keep him company so that he didn't go insane. He was actually grateful for her visits. Sasuke had visited him once before. Naruto was infuriated that he brought him here and cursed his name since he couldn't do much else without any chakra. 
Sasuke tried to assure him that it was for his own good, but Naruto wouldn't hear it. That was five months ago, and he hadn't heard from or seen the Uchiha since then. Naruto was drawn out of his thoughts when he heard the ever so familiar moan the door opening. He sat up so see Orochimaru gracing him with his presence. What do you want pedophile? Naruto growled. Dsktsk I thought we were past the nasty name calling Naruto-kun. I'm sure you wouldn't want me to go get the soap again. Naruto shivered at the thought. He once called Orochimaru a very explicit name who responded by sticking a bar of soap in his mouth for two hours. He definitely did not want to go through that again. Orochimaru chuckled at the distant expression on the blonde's face. He obviously was reminiscing on the aforementioned event. Actually I came to show you something that you might be interested in. It's about Konoha. Naruto snapped back to reality at the mention of Konoha. Maybe they had found him and sent a team to come rescues him. Or maybe Botch and herself was marching an army herself to come liberate him. Ha I told that someone would find me sooner or later. Orochimaru smirked. Actually it's quite the opposite, he said as he tossed a scroll to the boy. This was intercepted from a leaf courier in a few days ago. Naruto was hesitant at first, but he picked up the scroll, unraveled it and began to read its contents. He was confused as to why he was reading over an update on missing Min. His confusion quickly turned to shock when he came upon two pictures in the middle. The first was a picture of the last Ichiha himself, Sasuke. But the second was the one that stood out the most. It was a picture of him. The caption beneath read Naruto Uzumaki. Defected from the village during a mission. Wanted dead or alive for the crime of treason. Bounty. One million Ryo. Naruto's hand went stiff and the scroll dropped from his hands. Feelings of anger, betrayal, fear and most of all despair washed over him. So they've forsaken me after all Orochimaru watched the boy's reaction. His face was blank and expressionless, while his bright blue eyes were now dull and void of life. He had expected Naruto to be crushed by the news. That would make it easier to manipulate him. But there was something off about him now. It was almost as if he's given up the will to live. Naruto was silent for a few minutes, and Orochimaru decided to try to influence the boy while he was at his lowest. See Naruto-kun I tried to tell you. They don't care about you. They're trying to eliminate you. Eliminate me Naruto replied dully. Yes eliminate you. They only see you as a demon and want to rid the world of you as if you were a disease. Disease. Yes but I see something else. I see a young boy with tons of potential. Potential. Yes Naruto-kun and I can make you stronger, strong enough to protect yourself from the tyrants of Konoha. Make me stronger protect myself. Orochimaru smiled as he saw that he was getting through to the boy. He just needed to push a little further. Yes, Naruto-kun, stronger. Under my guidance you will be a force to be reckoned with. No longer will people call you a demon. You can finally gain the respect you so rightfully deserve. So what do you say Naruto-kun? You could sit here and wither away the rest of your life, or you can go out and prove the world wrong. Show them your true strength. Make them regret the day they looked down upon Naruto Uzumaki. Naruto was silent. He hadn't moved in the slightest since he had dropped the scroll. His village had forsaken him. His friends would come to hunt him down one day to bring him back to the village, only not as a citizen, but as a severed head in a scroll. No more friends to look after, no more dreams to fulfill, no more precious people to protect. It was just him now, him against the world. Only he didn't care about the world anymore. He could care less what people thought of him. But he would become strong enough to protect himself. He would only look out for number one. Teach me Orochimaru sama. The snake nin grinned widely. Not only did he have a strong Ichiha for his next vessel, but now he had the strongest of the tailed beast under his control. He might not be able to take over Naruto's body because of the demon within him, but with his undying loyalty and the Sharingan that was soon to be his, he would unlock the secret of the immortality and wreak havoc on the world. This is going to be fun, he chuckled to himself as he left the room, already planning ahead for the future. Chapter 2. Trouble in the Sand. It was a calm day in Kanoha. The sun was shining, the birds were chirping, and everyone happily moved about their business throughout the village. But all wasn't sunshine and smiles for one person in the village. Sunaid was sitting at her desk up to her neck in paperwork. She couldn't understand how there could possibly this much stuff going on in the village that needed her attention. She growled in frustration and slung the pen she was holding across the room. Damn it, why did I let that damn gaki talk me into this job? Her train of thought slowly began to turn towards the missing blonde. It had been a full three years since Naruto had left the village. A lot has happened in his absence. Team 77 was officially disbanded, and she took Sakura as her apprentice, while Kakashi went back to doing solo missions. After the villagers found out about Naruto's missing nin status, they held a week-long festival in celebration. Tsunade attempted to shut it down, but she was stopped by the council. She couldn't stop it because the council feared the village would erupt in anarchy. So as a way of getting back at the villagers, last year after the festival she had everyone assemble in the village center. There she gave a speech in which she revealed the truth behind Naruto's heritage. 
It came as a shock to learn that the demon brat was the son of the legendary fourth Hokage, especially to Naruto's friends. They found it hard to argue when they took in the fact that they indeed looked identical, and there was no one else in the history of the village with such bright blonde hair. Many wanted to deny that the demon was related to their village's greatest hero, but Tsunade quickly shut them up. She claimed she had valid proof as well as testimonies from high-ranking officials and ninjas to confirm her claim's validity. She explained how Minato sealed the Kikbi into Naruto because there was no other way to defeat the beast and he couldn't ask a villager to give up their child for the good of the village if he wasn't willing to do it himself. Minato wanted his son to be seen as a hero for saving the village and Tsunade berated them on how they disobeyed their leader's dying wish. After her rant, she simply left back to her office to work on more of that bastard paperwork. The council was in an uproar because of Tsunade's actions, claiming she no right to reveal classified information to the public. She in turn told them that it wasn't classified, the third just didn't want it getting out until the right moment. Since Naruto was a missing nin and no longer part of the village, she saw no problem with it. People were already out for his head as it is. The village was in a state of shock, and people spent the next few days pondering over what had just been revealed to them. Needless to say, there were no more festivals. Life just wasn't the same without the hyperactive blonde around. Everything just seemed dull now. Sakura had gone silent for a few months until she approached Tsunade asking her to take her as her student. Tsunade accepted, seeing the Rosette's determination to bring back her teammates. Lee held true to his promise, and for the last three years he ran 500 laps around the village every single day, which everyone, save Guy, believed to be unhealthy. Kakashi had grown distant toward everyone and if he wasn't on a mission, he was off somewhere reading that smut book of Jiraiya's. Tsunade probably missed him the most, and she secretly missed when he called her Bachan, not that she would ever admit it to anyone. It was like a sign that Naruto considered her as family. Yureya had also been absent for the last three years, off searching for Naruto. She had sent out occasional search parties every now and then when Jureya laid some information to her, but other than that, the hunt for the blonde was aborted. She put all her trust in Jureya to find the boy. So now she just spent her days waging an epic war against the demonic forces of paperwork. She still hadn't found a way to get past it, and she could never get a moment to rest with Shizun bringing in reinforcements every 10 minutes. Tsunade sighed as she fell back into her chair. She opened one of the desk-side drawers that held her hidden stash of sake. There would be hell to pay if Shizun ever found it. She reached for a half-empty bottle, ready to drain it of the rest of its heavenly elixir, until the office door crashed open and a panicked Shizun rushed in. Tsunade had already closed the drawer and put on her game face as she held a new pen in her hands, pretending like she was hard at work. Shizun entered the Hokage's office to find her actually doing work. The whole scene looked a little too suspicious for her tastes, especially since it was Tsunade who just sat there looking way too innocent. But she pushed that thought aside. She had urgent news for the Hokage. Tsunade Sama, I have urgent news. We've received Ensos from Suna. The Kazakiage has been kidnapped. Shizun said trying to catch her breath. She had run non-stop all the way from the messenger station. Kidnapped. Who in the hell goes around kidnapping cages? Tsunade all but yelled. The assailants are rumored to wearing straw hats and black cloaks covered in red clouds, Shizun answered. Tsunade's eyes widened as she recognized the culprits. Akatsuki, she growled. Shizun nodded in affirmation. This is bad. They must be after Shukaku. Indeed, Milady. Suna has request assistance in tracking them down and the safe retrieval of the Kazakiage, Shizun said. All right, get me teammate in Kakashi Haddock and I want them here yesterday. Time is of the essence here and we must act swiftly. Tsunade commanded, receiving a nod from her charge. Shizun left the office to track down the designated shinobi, while Tsunade sat back in her chair rubbing her temples. I'm getting too old for this, she groaned. And that's the situation in Suna. You four are to track and located the two Akatsuki members and help in the retrieval of the Kazakiage. Kakashi, you are the muscle of the group. This is an A-rank mission that it is to be completed with the utmost urgency. You are to leave immediately, dismissed. The ninja present nodded and filed out of the room. Deep within the northern hideout, one of the many hidden bases that make up a Togaker, two figures stood facing each other, preparing for battle. The first was a raven-haired teenage boy. He wore a white loose-fitting, long-sleeved shirt that was open at the front, leaving most of his chest exposed. The Achiha clan symbol rested at the base of his collar on the backside of his shirt. He wore navy pants and an indigo coat around his waist, which was held in place by a purple rope that also held his black shakin. The black cloth of his handguards extended to his elbows. His face was expressionless as he stared at his opponent across from him with cold onyx eyes. The other figure was also a teenager. His style of dress was similar to the others. The difference was that his shirt was high-collared, short-sleeved and black. The Uzumaki clan's red swirl adorned the back of his shirt. 
His shirt was only zipped up to his mid-chest, revealing his red undershirt and the first Hokage's green crystalline necklace. His pants were black while his coat was blood red and was held in place by an orange rope belt that also held his red chokin. His forearms were covered by black wrist warmers. Sun-bleached blonde locks hung loosely in front of his dull sapphire eyes, which were focused on the boy across from him. The raven-haired boy rolled down the sleeves of his hand guards revealing purple bracers with seals on them. Sasuke dropped his stance lightly and held his hands to his sides. Naruto unsheathed his blade and held it at the ready. Sasuke took a deep breath and closed his eyes. He channeled chakra into his fingers tapped the seals on his bracers. Shuriken instantaneously appeared in his hands, and he snapped his eyes open revealing his fully matured Shuringen. He flung them at the blonde across from him. He kept tapping the seals, and each time he did a shuriken popped out which he immediately launched forward. His arms were moving so fast that they seemed to phase in and out of existence. Naruto just looked impassively at the rain of steel coming towards him. His enhanced instincts kicked in, and he began to block the incoming Death Stars. Sasuke was sending an insane amount of shuriken his way, and he knocked away each expertly. Upon seeing his shuriken being batted away with ease, Sasuke began enhancing them with lightning chakra. Naruto was busy swatting away the harmless metallic stars when he noticed something different about them. They were covered in a static blue aura and sparked wildly when they made contact with his sword. He quickly deduced that Sasuke was using lightning chakra and charged his own sword with wind chakra. Wind's natural affinity over lightning showed as Naruto's wind-powered blade made quick work of the lightning shuriken as he cut them in half. Sasuke saw that he wasn't making any ground, so he quickly flipped through some hand signs. Fire style. Fireball jutsu. He called as he shot a burst of flame from his mouth. Naruto had just blocked the last of the shuriken when he saw the huge ball of fire hurtling towards him. He pumped even more wind chakra into his sword and delivered a vertical slice straight down the middle, easily splitting it in half. He gritted his teeth as he barely blocked the incoming strike aimed at his stomach. Sasuke smirked at having caught the blonde off guard, but it quickly disappeared when he realized he had been blocked. Sasuke quickly swung his free hand toward Naruto's face, only for it to be grabbed by the blonde's open palm. The two stood there pressing against one another, blade against blade, fist against hand, trying to overpower each other. Sasuke's expressionless face met with Naruto's disinterested look. Sasuke felt Naruto gaining the upper hand so cutting his losses, he pushed off and back flipped away. Naruto had always been the stronger of the two, while Sasuke was the fastest. Naruto took this time to twirl his sword in his hand into his familiar unorthodox reverse grip and entered his battle stance. Sasuke noticed the change in stance and readjusted himself into his usual kinjutsu stance. After a silent moment, the two rushed at each other, meeting head to head in a fierce sword battle. Orochimaru sat on his throne as he watched his students engage in a deadly dance. He smirked as he thought about their progress over the last three years. Sasuke surely did live up to his potential. He was the fastest in all of Atagakur, his strength was incredible, he was a master of the sword, and his ninjutsu was incredible. That Chidori of his proved to be rather troublesome, especially after he had trained the boy in lightning manipulation. Sasuke had also mastered his fully evolved Shuringen and even the curse mark. He was indeed a worthy vessel. But it was Naruto who had surprised him the most. After he began to train him, much to Sasuke's surprise, the boy began grow exponentially. His speed wasn't on par with Sasuke's, but it was still a force to be reckoned with. Where Naruto truly prevailed was his strength. Orochimaru never could figure out exactly where it came from, but the boy was a natural powerhouse. Sasuke had to enter the first stage of the curse mark just to get close to the boy's natural power. Tsunade herself would be proud. Naruto's kinjutsu was on the same level as Sasuke's, and their ninjutsu was about the same, except Sasuke had a more vast library. He was interrupted from his thoughts by two distinctive jutsu and a loud explosion in front of him. Naruto and Sasuke clashed as they met in the middle. Naruto swung low at Sasuke's ankles only for the Ichiha to leap up and send a downward slash his way. Naruto sidestepped the strike and swung his sword arm around in an attempt to decapitate his friend. Sasuke ducked at the last second and tried to split his rival in half with a sideswipe to the stomach. Naruto parried his strike and in the split second that the Ichiha was off guard, he delivered a roundhouse kick to Sasuke's chest that sent him flying. Sasuke recovered in midair and grimaced as he skidded to a stop. He always hated being hit by Naruto. The blonde strength was ridiculous. He didn't have much time to rest as Naruto was immediately in his face, again trying to knock his head of his shoulders with a spinning axe kick. Sasuke avoided the kick, but barely had time to register the silver blade flying at his neck right afterwards. With the help of his Sharingan, Sasuke parried the blade mere inches before it struck his jugular. He pushed off Naruto's sword and began his counter-attack. They swiped at each other repeatedly but were at a stalemate. Every swing was either blocked, parried, or dodged completely. The rhythmic sound of clanging metal echoed throughout the room. 
With their swordsmanship being on the same level, they were going nowhere fast. Sasu parried another of Naruto's strikes, but instead of retaliating with his own, he sent Chakra into his left hand, and Ichidori sparked to life. Naruto immediately kicked away from the Ichiha when the ever-so-familiar sound of birds chirping hit his ears, narrowly dodging the jab aimed at his heart. He skidded to a stop and looked up to see Sasu charging at him, sword poised to strike, and Chidori still encased over his hand. Naruto quickly formed a Rasengan in in his left hand and dashed forward to meet his rival head-on. As they drew closer, Sasuke swung his sword in an overheard diagonal slash, hoping to split the blonde in half. Naruto saw this coming and countered with his own upward diagonal strike in the opposite direction of Sasuke's. Their blades met in a mighty clang, and they were at another stalemate, but they were finished yet. They both thrust their chakra-powered hands at the other and met in their greatest stalemate of them all. Dodori, Rasengan. Their techniques clashed between them as they battled for dominance. No matter how hard they tried, they couldn't overwhelm the other's attack. Sasuke saw this and opened up his curse mark slightly. As the black flame mark spread across his body, the Chidori in his hand took on a purplish hue, and he began to push back the blonde. Naruto, upon feeling the Ichiha's sudden increase in strength, tapped into some of the Kikpi's chakra. His eyes flashed red and his pupils grew slitted. The Rasengan in his hand glowed red as it matched the power of Sasuke's violet Chidori. The two were once again on even grounds. But being the competitive types they were, they wouldn't just settle for even. The two teens began pumping more and more chakra into their hands, causing the jutsu they held to grow unstable from lack of control. Both ignored the shaking ground and the debris that kicked up around them and focused only on defeating the other. Suddenly, their hands grew bright, catching both boys' attention as their jutsu pulsed uncontrollably. Something unexpected happened next. The Chidori and the Rasengan fused as Sasuke's hand met Naruto's, and the whole room was blanketed in a flash of light. The loud explosion ensued and dust scattered everywhere. Hirachimaru raised his arm to his face to shield his eyes from the incoming debris. He looked up as the dust settled to find Naruto and Sasuke a few feet apart from one another, both panting heavily. Well that was unexpected. Kakashi of the Sharingan's Shidori and the fourth Hokage's Rasengan truly destructive jutsu. Those two really outdid themselves Hirachimaru thought to himself. He decided to end their friendly spar before they killed one another or caved in his precious hideout. Alright boys excellent work but that's enough for today. I don't need you splattering each other all over the walls. Blood is rather troublesome to clean up. He chuckled. Dust then Kabuto land in front of him in a kneeling position. Hirachimaru sama, I have urgent news. He spoke. The snake man raised his arm beckoning him to continue. It seems as though the Akatsuki are on the move again. We've just received word from our scouts in Suna that they have just captured the one tail. Naruto picked up the last part of the sentence and made his way over to Orochimaru's throne. What's happened to Gara? He asked as he approached the older men. He's been abducted by the Akatsuki Naruto-kun, Kabuto answered. Naruto didn't immediately respond. He stood there for a few seconds leaving the two men in front of him confused. After a moment of silence, Naruto spoke again. Orochimaru sama I'm going to Suna, he said as he took his leave. Naruto-kun, I must advise against that. The Akatsuki are still after the tailed BASTS-5, and if you leave they might get you too, Kabuto warned him. Naruto snorted at his remark. I'm going, he said with finality and left the room. Kabuto turned to his master for help, but was left puzzled by the snake nin smile. Kabuto I see you doubt Naruto-kun's skills. Let him go. If we're lucky, he'll take out an Akatsuki member or two. That'll be less work for us in the future, but Orochimaru-sama, is he really that strong? Kabuto queried. Orochimaru's grin said it all. Well we should at least send Sasu Kun with him. That way, not gonna happen. It's going to rain soon and I'm going to practice that jutsu, Sasu interrupted Kabuto as he left the room. Well, there you have it Kabuto. You needn't worry so much. I will now take my leave, Orochimaru yawned as he exited to his private quarters, leaving Kabuto all by his lonesome. Naruto stared out over the mountains from the roof of the hideout. He now donned a black cloak. A thunderstorm is rolling in, he said to himself as he observed the dark cloud inching closer by the minute. He had to leave now to make it to Suna in time. He had to save Gara. He was one of the only few people who Naruto didn't forsake. They were both inch cricky and understood each other's pain. Both knew what it was like to grow up being treated like demons. He couldn't sit by idly and let the Akatsuki kill his friend, especially if he could do something about it. Naruto closed his eye and took a deep breath. His eyes shot open as he dashed forward and leapt off the cliff before him. Naruto went into a freefall as he barreled down the side of the mountain that the northern hideout was built in. The wind whipped through his hair, which had grown out a little over the years, and his cloak flapped wildly as he reached terminal velocity. He loved the feeling of the wind against his skin, and this was one of the only times that he was at peace. When he saw himself nearing the bottom, he let out a low pitch whistle. Seconds before he was splattered all over the ground, he was caught by a blue and white blur. 
Naruto remained impassive as his companion caught him in the nick of time. The bird-like dragon beneath him mimicked his master's expression as it raced through the mountains at near supersonic speeds. The lower half of its body was blue with streamlined jet plane wings. It had a red triangle-shaped ring on its chest. Its gray and blue arms were tucked into its body in order to reduce air resistance. The upper half of its body was gray, it had triangle-shaped ears and a blue face with a gray teardrop shape in the middle. This dragon was Naruto's personal companion. It wasn't a summon per se, but it always answered his call. His name was Leishos. Naruto had met Leishos under mysterious circumstances just over two years ago. While on his was on his way back from retrieving a scroll for Orochimaru, he encountered a strange blue and black fox-like creature. The fox gave him a gem called a soul dew and told him it would be necessary to fulfill a prophecy. Naruto didn't know what he meant by that, and before he could question the fox's motives it was gone. Naruto held on to the soul dew and kept it in his waist pouch. Three weeks later during a spar with Sasuke, the gem began to resonate. Naruto took it out of his pouch when it began to glow brightly. It suddenly gave off a bright flash and bathed the surrounding area in light. When the light cleared, they were face to face with the young Leishos. Naruto and Sasuke were shocked to say the least. Orochimaru was just as surprised but grinned in interest. Leishos was an impeccable companion. He was incredibly fast and had a host of attacks, most of which unknown in nature. Orochimaru wanted to run tests on him, but Naruto wouldn't allow it. The fact that he was leaking Kikbi's chakra and his voice was oozing with malice helped to get the point across. Orochimaru never brought the subject up again. Since there wasn't exactly a place to keep a growing dragon within the confines of the secret hideouts, Naruto just allowed Leishos to roam free. Whenever he needed him he would just whistle, and Leishos would appear almost immediately by his side. Naruto had no fear of Leishos being caught since his speed was unmatched anywhere else, and he was strong enough to defend himself. That and he has the ability to turn invisible. Leishos had grown into a formidable beast over the last two years. He was just under seven feet in length, just bigger than any human, but still small enough to retain his swift agility. It was only last year that Naruto had experimented with riding him. Their first few attempts were sketchy and nearly cost them their lives at one point, but as time progressed, they began to get the hang of it. Now they were totally in sync when they flew and became masters of the aerial art. It showed in the way that they shot through the mountain pass at an incredible velocity. Naruto and Leishos quickly made it out of the mountains and were now zooming over a forest. Naruto tapped Leishos on the side of his long neck. Leishos felt his master's silent command and began to ease up. The duo were now leisurely gliding through the air. Naruto felt that this was a reasonable speed for such a long travel. It wouldn't do well if Leishos tired himself out. If they kept their current pace, they would reach Suna in two days. Naruto was eager to reach the sand country though. He had to save Gara. He was sick of his kind being used and abused. Gara, I'll be there soon. Wait for me he thought as they continued the long journey to the land of wind. The mate, with the addition of Kakashi, were currently en route to the hidden sand village. Once there, they were to receive a briefing on the current situation and more details of the assailants. They were hoping to get some kind of lead as to the general direction or location they were last seen. The Leaf Nin quietly made their way through the forest as they approached the land of wind border. Kiba was on point with Akamaru, Kurunai, and Shino followed right behind him in the middle, while Kakashi and Hinata were in the back. Kiba was responsible for sniffing out any possible traps or enemies that may lurk ahead of them, while Hinata used her Byakugan to detect any enemies that tried to sneak up behind them. They had been traveling at a steady pace for about a day and a half now, and exhaustion was beginning to overtake them. Boy Kurunai-sensei, when can one take a break? Kiba whined as he gazed back at the crimson-eyed woman. Kurunai looked back and met Kakashi's gaze. Kakashi saw he implied question and nodded his head in affirmation. All right everyone let's set up camp for the night, Kurunai said. Finally. We've been running for. Kurunai sensei, there's an unidentified object rapidly approaching from the rear. Hinata yelled, interrupting Kiba. Hinata, can you get a fix on it? Kurunai asked calmly. No, it's moving too fast. It'll be upon us any second now. The Haika heiress replied. Just then, something flew past them at an incredible speed, kicking up a lot of dust and shaking leaves off the trees in its wake. The Kanohan Inn braced themselves against the violent whirlwind that overcame them. Moments later, the wind ceased and the surrounding area was calm again. What the hell was that? Kiba exclaimed snorting out dirt that flew up its nose. I don't know but did anyone get a good look at it? Kurunai asked. Everyone shook their heads negative. Well whatever the hell it was it sure was fast ow. Kiba, what did I say about that kind of language? Kurunai berated the brunette teenager who was profusely rubbing the knot on his head. Amit Kurunai sensei that he was interrupted by another smack to the head. His previous bump now had a twin. Ow. Okay. Okay. I get it jeez. Kiba yelled and started to mumble something incoherent about freedom of speech and crazy older women. 
Hinata giggled at her teammate's antics. Bakashi stared in the direction that the unknown object took off in. He was just barely able to make out some details with the help of his Sharingan. Whatever it was, it was white, blue and had small hints of red and black. It also had wings. He thought he saw what looked like sunny blonde hair, but he wasn't completely sure. Lastly, the object gave off a faint familiar presence. He wasn't sure what it was exactly, but he was certain he had felt it before. Bakashi sensei I know you're getting old, but at least try to keep up. Kiba yelled from ahead. Kakashi snapped back to reality to see his team a good 20 meters down the road. He quickly took off and caught up with the rest of the group. He's Kakashi sensei what's with the spacing out? Kiba queried. Oh ha ha sorry about that. I saw a squirrel wrestling with a raccoon over an acorn and I wanted to see who would win, the silver haired Jimin replied. Okay weird Kiba said as he mumbled on about crazy Jimins and bad liars. Naruto stared into a small fire he had set up as he reclined against a sleeping Laishos. He his sword in his left hand and a whetstone in his right as he careful sharpened the blade. Night had taken over and he set up camp a few meters from where the edge of the forest met the desert. They had been traveling for a while now and he figured they should get a good rest before they arrived in Suna tomorrow. While flying earlier, Naruto thought he felt some familiar presences on the ground below, but he brushed it aside. The only thought on his mind was saving Gara. He let out a soft yawn as fatigue crept up on him. He sheathed his blade and set it beside him with the rest of his stuff. His coat, shirt and cloak sat next to him neatly folded, while his wrist warmers and waist pouch rested neatly on top. The thick orange rope belt was rolled up and sat at the base of the pile. This left him in only his undershirt, pants, and calf-length sandals. The cool, gentle breeze from the desert swept through the small clearing. The fire danced slightly with the wind before returning to its subtle flickering. Naruto shot to his feet when he gazed through the fire and thought he saw what looked like a small fox-like figure standing across from him. But there was nothing there. Must be more tired than I thought I was he thought to himself before sitting back down. Naruto settled even more into the sleeping beast behind him as he tried to come up with a plan for tomorrow. But before he could come up with anything, fatigue finally claimed him and with the combined efforts of the soft crackling of the fire and Liado's rhythmic breathing, he was slowly lulled to sleep. The five-man cell of Leaf Nin arrived in Suna the next day. The city was relatively calm for just having their leader kidnapped. The people just went about their lives like any other day. After a short walk through town they arrived at the Kazakija's office. They entered to see a highly distressed Tamari sitting at the desk. She looked up when heard them walk in. Finally, you're here. She exclaimed, barely keeping her composure. The Kashi stepped forward to speak we are the tracking team sent from Kanoha. What's the current status on the situation? Three nights ago, the city was attacked by the Akatsuki. He was alone and he flew around the city dropping bombs everywhere. That's when Gara stepped out to face him. They squared off in the skies above Suna and just when Gara seemed to gain the upper hand, he exploded. Gurunai raised an eyebrow. What do you mean exploded? We don't know exactly. Gara had the Akatsuki member pinned and next thing you know his gourd just exploded and he was knocked unconscious. The Akatsuki guy created some weird clay-like bird that scooped up Gara, and they flew away, Tamari explained. I see. Do you have any clarifications as to their last whereabouts? Kakashi asked. No not exactly, but people have reported seeing a giant white bird flying across the desert toward river country. My best guess is to start there, the younger Jimin responded. Understood, we shall leave now, Kurinai said as their team headed for the door. One more thing, Tamari began, effectively halting them in their tracks. They all turned around to meet her gaze. Yes, what is it? Kakashi spoke. I want you guys to take Lady Chiyo with you. She's the one who sealed Shukaku into Gara, and she should be able to fix any damage his seal might have sustained. Don't let the old bag of bones fool you, she's still a strong fighter. Understood, Kakashi said as his team exited. She'll be waiting by the western gate. Tamari called after them fight before the door closed. Naruto and Leishos were gliding above the desert on a course for Suna. He had arranged to meet up with one of the sound spies that had been placed within the village. With any luck, he would obtain some information on Gara's location. The hidden sand village came into view shortly, and Naruto began his plan to infiltrate. Leisho shot right over the city and dropped his master off. Naruto suppressed his chakra as he skydived into Suna. He tucked his arm in to increase his velocity. The faster he reached the ground, the lesser the chance of him being detected. Upon seeing the ground grow closer, Naruto spread his arms out with his cloak, and using his wind manipulation, he halted his fall five feet from the ground. He landed in an alleyway off the main road. He pulled on his hood and stepped out of the alley, blending in with the crowd. He hinged his cloak to appear a sandy brown. I wouldn't do good to go around in a black one right after the Akatsuki struck. He quietly sifted through the crowd making his way down the street. Not one person paid him any mind. After walking for about 10 minutes he came arrived at his destination. 
It was a dango shop on a corner off the village's main square. He stepped inside and was shown to a table by a bubbly brunette around his age. Here's your table sir. What can I get you today? She asked. Dust a stick of dango and a glass of water please, Naruto answered as he sat down. Humming right up. She smiled at him before walking off. Naruto sat there patiently for about five minutes till his food arrived. He took notice of the hooded man who sat at the table behind him, their backs to each other. The waitress returned shortly with Naruto's order, and he ate silently. After he finished his snack, he picked up a subtle tapping noise behind him. He recognized it as the Morse code system that Orochimaru set up. It only seemed befitting for sound shinobi. It was light and unless you trained your ears accordingly, you wouldn't be able to pick it up. Greetings, Naruto-san. Orochimaru-sama informed me of your arrival two days ago. Naruto took his empty dango stick and began tapping lightly on the table. What's the situation? He asked. It would seem as though the Akatsuki infiltrated the village three nights ago and challenged the Kazakiage. The Kazakiage fought in the skies above the village a blonde Akatsuki member. He was reported to be using clay bombs, the spy responded. So they sent to Daraha. That means Asori's probably accompanying them. Any updates as to their last known whereabouts? Reports have come in about sightings of a large clay-like bird flying over the desert headed towards river country. Akatsuki has a base there that's about a day's travel from here. They're probably extracting the Achibi as we speak I'll take my leave now. Thanks for the information. With that, Naruto stood up to leave, but a last minute tapping caught his ear. Naruto said I feel it important to warn you that Kanohanin were spotted in the village earlier. They are most likely here as reinforcements. You should be careful out there. Naruto remained silent and just nodded. He turned to leave, but he bumped into someone. The brunette waitress from earlier was carrying a tray of food to a group of people in the back. She tried to slip through some tables but lost her balance when she bumped into the stranger she seated earlier. She felt herself falling to the ground before she was caught in the embrace of a pair of strong arms. Reacting on instinct, Naruto swiftly caught her in his left arm and the falling tray of food in his right. The way he caught her left them staring face to face. She immediately noticed the blonde locks underneath his hood and became lost in his oceanic sapphire eyes. He slowly helped her to feet and handed her back the tray. Careful there, wouldn't want you to get hurt, he said with a small smile. She felt her cheeks heat up as she watched him leave. All throughout this small altercation, a man clad in a black cat-like suit sat in the back of the shop and analyzed what just happened. Those reflexes just now who was that guy? Kenkram thought to himself. Naruto quickly made his way to the village's outer walls after leaving the shop. But as he was making his way down the main road, something glimmered in his peripheral vision, catching his attention. He turned to his right to face the window of a jewelry shop and saw the offending object resting on a podium behind the glass. He approached the window to get a better look. What he saw when he approached the glass was a pair of necklaces siding side by side shimmering in the sunlight. One was golden and shaped like the sun with a shiny ruby resting in the center. Its twin resting beside it was a silver moon that held an aquamarine jewel in its crescent. Perfect Naruto thought as he stepped into the store. He left the store five minutes later and conspicuously climbed the wall and leapt out into the desert where Leishos, who was waiting nearby, swiftly caught him. With his newly acquired intel, Naruto set out for river country, intent on stopping whatever plans the Akatsuki had in store. Meanwhile, in a cave deep within river country, two men wearing black cloaks cover in red clouds stood atop the fingers of a statue. Astral projections of took up the other fingers. The right thumb was occupied by a man with spiked hair and purple, ringed eyes. The right index was taken up by a man with long blonde hair that was put up into a ponytail. Atop the right middle stood a woman with a flower in her hair, and a scarlet-eyed man stood next to her on the ring finger. A plant-like man stood on the pinky finger. On the left hand, a shark-faced man stood on the ring finger, a green-eyed man occupied the middle, a man carrying a large three-bladed scythe stood atop the index, and lastly, the thumb was taken up by a short, robust man who was hunched over. Each wore a ring on the same appendage on which they stood. Floating between the hands of the statue was the unconscious form of the Kazakiage, surrounded by a pool of blue chakra, as red chakra flowed out of his eyes and mouth and into the mouth of the statue. Moments later, the flow of red chakra ceased and the chakra pool dissipated, dropping Gara's lifeless body to the ground. The statue's mouth closed and one of its nine eyes opened. The ceiling of the Achibi is complete, the ring-dyed man spoke. It's about damn time too. I was starting to get this mean crook in my neck. The scythe-wielding man whined. Hayden, shut up before I kill you, the green eye man threatened. Kiss my ass Kakazu. You've been saying that for the last year yet here I am alive and well, Hayden snorted back. Enough you too. The ring-eyed man interrupted. Sasori, Didara, our scouts have picked up ten individuals headed your way. They are mostly likely from Suna and are coming to reclaim their leader. Dispose of them, he commanded. Yes leader Sama, their voices echoed throughout the cave. Chapter 3. 
confrontation. Then figures appeared in a large open area with a giant rock structure and a small lake that sat in front of it. The Kashi and Kurinai's group had met up with Guy's team, who Tsunade had sent along as backup just in case. The group of shinobi stepped out onto the lake and walked up to a giant boulder with a slip of paper on it. Kakashi approached the boulder and raised his headband to scan the paper with his Sharingan. After a few moments, Kakashi pushed his headband back down and sighed as he stepped back to the group. It's just I thought. This is a five seal barrier, he said. What's that Kakashi sensei? Kiba asked. It's a special seal that creates a barrier around a place by placing four tags in different locations surrounding a fifth tag on the location to be protected. The tags are placed on flat surfaces and are connected with the user's chakra. It's a high probability that the one we seek are in there, Kakashi explained. So we just take off the seal, go and kick the Akatsuki guy's asses, grab Gara, return him to Suna, and become heroes right? Kiba asked. That is a most excellent idea Kiba. Lee interjected with a fist pump. Everyone sweat dropped at the duo's simplicity and brashness. It doesn't work like that guys. In order to dispel the barrier, all five tags must be removed simultaneously, meaning we'll have to split up. Problem is, the other four could be anywhere around here, and we have no idea where to start, Kakashi said. The group began to ponder the current situation. Each began devising ways to ascertain the location of the four remaining seals. After about five minutes of rolling ideas around in his head, Shino spoke up. The Kashi sensei, you said that the tags are laced with the user's chakra right? He asked the silver eyed Jimin. That's right, Kakashi replied. Then it is possible that we Hinata and Niji should be able to locate them with their Byakugans, the bug clad Jknin said. Everyone's eyes widened and they directed their gaze toward the two Haikta. It's worth a shot, Niji said simply. I'll try my best, Hinata stammered. Both form a one-handed tiger sign and called out by Akigan, their normally invisible pupils became slightly more distinct and the veins around their temples bulged as they scanned the surrounding area for chakra signatures. Their eyes returned to normal less than two minutes later and they relayed their findings. There's one a kilometer north of our position and another a half kilometer to the west, Nietzsche said. Anata hesitated. She glanced behind her and scanned the area hastily. Discovering nothing she sneezed lightly and turned back to the group. One is half kilometer to the east, and the last lies one and a half kilometers to the south, Hinata said finally. The Kashi stared at the girl as processed her recent actions. It was almost as if she had seen or sensed something, but there was nothing there. Pushing it to the back of his mind for now, he brought forth the plan he devised. All right, here's the plan, Kakashi began. Niji, you and Lee take the tags to the north and west, while Hinata and Shino take care of the tags to the south and east. Fenton I want you to back up Hinata. He noticed the bun-haired girl's scowl and continued before she could interrupt. I am by no means demeaning either of your skills as Kanoichi, but I would feel more comfortable with you watching Hinata's back. There's no telling what Kinda Asikos are out there or what would happen if Hinata was injured and left at the mercy of the enemy. When he saw their understanding nods of agreement, he finished explaining his plan. The rest of us will wait here and when you four are in position, radio in, and the five of us will remove the tags and lift the barrier. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Kakashi finished. Hiba's hand almost immediately shot up. Hiba you shut up. I've had it with your idiotic remarks. I swear, you're just like and Kakashi caught himself before he slipped up. His one visible eye grew very void and distant. Then it suddenly sprang back to life and he turned to the four aforementioned Chknin. Anyway, if you guys are ready, head out now. This must be done in the utmost urgency as the Kazakija's fate depends on it. Now scatter. He commanded. He received an affirmative yes, and the five younger shinobi disappear from sight. Naruto sat high up in a tree masking his chakra signature with an invisible Aishos hovering nearby. He expected to run into Konoha shinobi, but he hadn't expected them all to be people he knew. In the clearing before him stood the members of Team Guy, Team 8, his old sensei, and some short old lady. If he wasn't mistaken, she was Chio, the legendary puppeteer of Suna. The Kashi had just stepped away from the boulder and was currently speaking with the group. He idly hung back and watched the situation develop. He really wanted to save Gara, but to take one the Akatsuki and Kanoha would be suicidal. He would be worn out from fighting one and mostly be captured by the other and either be forcibly returned to the hidden leaf or have the kick be ripped from his body. He'd be damned if that happened. As he observed the group of planning leaf nin down below, his gaze fell upon one particular member of his old group of peers. He couldn't seem to take his eyes off the pearl-eyed brunette Kanoichi. Anata left him bewildered. She was one of the few people in Kanoha that he did not forsake. She was also one of the few people that showed him any compassion, albeit she was extremely shy about it. He remembered how she used to blush and stutter a lot whenever she was around him, and he always thought she was just weird. But after growing up and looking back on it, he realized she must have been nervous about something. 
He originally thought it was because she found out about the demon, but dismissed the thought because it wouldn't explain the blush. Perhaps she was a closet pervert of the sort. Regardless, she intrigued him and he couldn't figure out why. He hadn't really known her all that well. In fact, the only memories he had directly associated with her was during the Chiknin exams, when after his fight against Kiba, she had given him some medicine and her fight against Niji where she almost lost her life. He swore on her blood that he would beat him in the finals. Thinking back, he kinda wished he had gotten to know her a little better. Who knows what could have happened. Naruto was buried so deep in his thoughts that he barely registered that he had locked eyes with a very girl that was on his mind. He tensed and felt his stopped. He gripped the handle of his sword, preparing for a fight in case he had been found out. But she just swiveled her head as if scanning the area before sneezing and turning back to the others. He sighed in relief but felt his heart skip a beat and his cheeks warm faintly. What was that this feeling just now? His thoughts were interrupted by a shout from Kakashi, and he turned back just in time to see Hinata, Niji, Lee, and the bug kid whose name he couldn't remember disappear while Kakashi, Guy, Kiba, Kurinai and Chio stayed behind. They must have figured out a way to get past that barrier. I'll sit here and see what happens. If a fight breaks out, I'll hang back and let them tire out the Akatsuki and wait for my chance to strike he thought as he settled back into the tree and focused his gaze on the clearing before him. Anada's mind was still on the anomaly she felt back in the clearing as she rushed through the forest beside Shino and Tenten. She was almost positive she felt another chakra signature behind them, but it quickly disappeared before she could confirm it. What was even more baffling was that chakra felt familiar. It was like she hadn't felt it in a while, but it was definitely familiar in a way, but she didn't know exactly how. Shino looked back to Hinata when he saw her starting to lag behind and grew concerned when he saw the unfocused look in her eyes. He called out to her repeatedly, and she finally replied after the fifth time. Huh? Oh Shino-kun what is it? She asked. Hinata are you okay? You were falling behind and you seem unfocused. He told her. Hinata blushed at having been caught slacking off. What would her father think if he heard about this? I'm as sorry. I was lost in thought, Hinata apologized. It's okay Hinata, just try to stay focused, he reassured her. We should keep moving. The first tag should be coming up soon right? Tenten asked. Why yes, it's in a clearing just ahead. Hinata stammered. The three of them continued on through the forest towards their objective. The Kashi stood in the clearing, reflecting over the mistake he almost made earlier. He had almost called Kiba Naruto. It had been almost three years, but the disappearance of the blonde still hurt. No one knew whether he was still alive or not, leaving it to imagination about his current status. The Kashi hoped that he was alive and that wherever he was he was safe. Most of all, he hoped that he was happy. God knows that Naruto deserves it the most after his troubled childhood. His thoughts on the subject came to an end when he heard voices ringing through the headset in his ear. In position at the east tag, Shino said. North tag ready to be pulled, Niji said. Yosh. I am ready here in the west, Lee exclaimed. We're ready here in the south, Tenten said. Alright everyone nice work, Kakashi commended them. Okay on my count, everyone remove their tag. One two three now. As soon as they heard the order, they all ripped off the seal in front of them. Back with Kakashi's group, the boulder began to faintly glow blue, and the aura disappeared as quick as it appeared. Kakashi turned to the older green beast. I would you mind? Yash. I will destroy this boulder with the ever-burning flame of youth. Severe leaf hurricane. Guy delivered a vicious kick to the center of the boulder, and it shattered into hundreds of smaller rocks and pebbles. A powerful gust of wind blew out of the cave, causing them to take a step back. Just as they were about to step inside, Kakashi heard the frantic voices of their charges echo through his mick. The Kashi sensei, something's wrong. After I pulled at the tag, the surface it was on distorted and a clone of me appeared, and it's intent on not letting me leave, Niji explained. Same here, said Shino. What kind of unyouthful trickery is this? Lee asked. It seems that a trap was sprung when the barrier was deactivated. It looks like you guys are going to have to defeat your Depelginger and regroup with the rest of us as soon as possible, Kakashi explained. Understood. Rang four voices in his ear. Yash. I get unleash my flames of youth against myself. This will prove to be a most youthful duel and test of my skills. Lee exclaimed excitedly. The Kashi turned back to ease the concerned looks of his comrades. They just ran into some trouble but are taking care of it quickly before come back to regroup with us. On the other hand, we need to search this cave for any clues about the Akatsuki and Gara. But tread carefully, we are dealing with the Akatsuki after all, he warned. They all nodded in affirmation before stepping into the dark cave. The inside of the cave was fairly large, almost as large as the clearing that sat at its doorstep. The group of shinobi carefully advanced forward using the small amount of light that spilled in from the large entrance. Kiba, who had been sniffing the air ever since they entered, raised his hand to stop the group and warn them of a presence in front of them. 
Up there, it smells of gara, clay, iron, and death. When their eyes finally adjusted to the dim lighting, they immediately noticed two figures clad in black cloaks and what looked like a giant white bird sitting at the other side of the cave. The Dar and Sasori were resting peacefully in the back of the hideout when the boulder placed in front of the entrance suddenly shattered. Shortly after, five figures and what looked like a giant dog eased their way in. The figures all stopped after walking for some time, and Dadara took it as that they had been found out. Time to get this over with I guess he groaned to himself as he stepped forward. Well look who it is. Some run-of-the-mill leaf ninja and a washed-up old hag, Dadara spoke to the group. Give us back the Kazakiage, Kakashi said in a sharp tone. Oh him? Dadara asked as he pointed back to the large bird that had the limp form of Gara hanging out of its mouth. It then tilted his head back and swallowed Gara's body whole. Nah, I was thinking we could hold on to him. Besides, Sasori Senpai might make a puppet out of him later, if Leader Sama finds no use for it, he said, invoking a response from the youngest of the group. You bastards. Give us back Gara before I rip you to shreds. Kiba roared. The Dara scoffed at his threat. Please, a little brat like you. You might have a chance in say, 10 to 20 years. Come back and challenge me then. Kiba stood there growling and poised to attack. He would have had the other Akatsuki dude spoke. The Dara stopped playing around. Get out of here and go back to base. I'll stay here and finish them off, Sasori ordered his junior. Oh, but I wanted to show them my art Sasori senpai, Dadara whined. Sasori snorted. That useless display of explosives that you call art. Ha. Huh. That's not art. Fine art is something that traverses the sands of time and still maintains its elegance, much like my puppets, Sasori said. Dadara was about to retort, but he sensed an attack coming at him. He leapt up into the air and swiftly dodged the two mini cyclones that struck where he once stood. He heard Dog Boy curse at his attack's failure as he landed on the bird, which pushed off the ground and into the air. Dadara, leave now. Sasori commanded. Yeah, yeah I'm going. The blonde shouted back as he flew towards the entrance. Damn it he's getting away. Kurunai cursed. We must not let him escape, Guy said. The Kashi stood there quickly formulating a plan. He was slightly taken aback by the duo's sudden argument, but now his mind was back on track. Guy's right, he can't escape. Kiba, Akamaru and I are the best at tracking, so we'll pursue him. Can you guys handle this guy on your own? Most definitely my youthful eternal rival. We shall blow this monstrosity of a man awat with the power of youth. Guy exclaimed assuming his nice guy pose. Kakashi smiled at his rival. Alright then, I'll leave it to you. Kiba, Akamaru, let's go. Kakashi yelled, and the two ninja and Ninkin hurriedly left the cave to pursue the fleeing Dadara. Yash. Kurunai-san, Chiyobasama, let's let our flames of youth explode. Guy fist pumped. Naruto was sitting by idly waiting for something to develop when a large white bird with a blonde man in an Akatsuki cloak barreled out of the cave entrance and shot over him at an amazing speed. As he passed, Naruto caught the faintest glimpse of a familiar smell waft past his nose. There's no doubt about it, that was Gara. The Dara must have him he was about to call Aishos and take off after the ballistic bomber, but he stopped when he saw Kakashi, Kiba, and Akamaru emerge from the cave, hot on his trail. Naruto hid back in the tree until they passed. He was now at a loss for how to approach the situation. If he pursued them, he would be able to save Gara and possibly eliminate an Akatsuki member, but at the same time he would have to confront Kanohanin, one who just happened to be his old sensei. Fighting the Akatsuki and Kanoha would leave even him winded, and there was the possibility of being captured by either side. One would mercilessly rip the chakra entity that was Kikbi from his body, and the other would forcibly return him to his old village, where he would face persecution once more and possibly face death. Neither option sounded favorable. After pondering on it for a second, Naruto came to a conclusion. I'll tail them hang back to see what happens. If they get into a fight, I'll wait for an opportune moment to strike on Dadara and free Gara. If I'm lucky, Kakashi and Kiba will be too tired out to put up a front. Naruto called Leishos who swung by and picked up his master. Leishos soared high into the sky to avoid detection as they headed south to catch up to the fleeing Dadara and his pursuers. Dynamic Entry. Dai's attack finally hit home on the fleeing Sasori, and he watches the body before him shattered. A young boy with short red hair stepped out of the disfigured corpse. Chiyo gasped when she saw his face. Sasori, there's no way. How are you so young? She asked. Sasori turned his uninterested gaze to her. I see the sands of time haven't been as nice to you as they have to me grandmother. A look of shock adorned Kurunai's face, and Guy let out an exaggerated gasp. Chiyo Basama, is this true? This unyouthful lad here is your own grandson. He asked. Chiyo merely nodded. Yes, it's true. Sasori is my son's son and was a Suna shinobi before he defected 20 years ago. There's absolutely no way he should look so young though. Perhaps he is using a henge technique just like Tsunade-sama to hide his true form, Kurunai offered his insight. Chiyo snorted. 
I highly he has anything visual to hide unlike that old hag, guy was about respond about how she shouldn't talk about their leader, such an unyouthful way when they all jumped a few feet back to avoid a huge black spike that converged on their position. Tesori stood a few feet away with an annoyed look. He grew tired of them and summoned the his third Kazakiage puppet. Utilizing the body's natural affinity for magnet release, be conjured forth a third's legendary iron sand and tried to end them all at once. I grow tired of this grandmother. Allow me to end your feeble existence once and for all here and now, Sasori said as he sent iron spikes, courtesy of the third Kazakiage, at them. They all dispersed from their current position to evade the incoming attack. Guy slid to a stop before charging directly at Sasori, hoping to engage the missing Nin and Tajutsu. Just as he got close, he was intercepted by Sasori's puppet, which swung at him with its blade-covered arm. Guy backflipped away to avoid being lacerated. I san you must proceed with caution, Chiyo warned him. Sasori is known for using highly toxic poisons, and you could get infected from the slightest cut if you're not careful. The aforementioned man sent smirked and sent his puppet on a crash course toward the green glad ninja. Guy backpedaled and dodged the numerous lethal strikes thrown his way. Dodging one particular strong swipe, he made a beeline for Sasori. But right as he got to him, the puppet intercepted him again, and Guy began him long and tedious routine of flipping and dodging all over again. While Guy was fleeing for his life, Chio took this time to unseal two puppets. One had a striking resemblance to Sasori, and it was named Father the other puppet, Mother, had long brown hair. Kurinai was busy trying to assess the situation when the older woman spoke to her. Kurinai-san, I'm going to engage him directly with my own puppets. With his attention focused on two different fronts, he will be left wide open, so you should hide away and wait for an opportune time to strike him down. Kurinai nodded and disappeared into the shadows with a Jinjutsu. Tsusori was so focused on eliminating the weird man clad in that sickly green jumpsuit that he almost didn't catch the movement in his peripherals. Left jumped back just in time to dodge the blade aimed at his neck, courtesy of a red-haired puppet that he recognized all too well. So you're you those worthless things huh? You truly are pathetic grandmother, he told the elderly woman. Tsusori, these were the first puppets you ever created. You didn't seem to think that way about them when you were younger, Chio responded. Tsusori remained impassive as he recalled the third Kazakiage to his side. Guy finally caught a breather when he slid to a stop beside Chio. Bai San, stand tall if you can. We must distract him long enough until Kurinai San can take him down. Chio Basama, is do you have a plan in mind? Guy panted. Yeah, don't get poisoned and stay alive, she answered. I regained his breath and stood tall. Yosh, let our flames of youth explode. He exclaimed as he opened the first of the eight gates. The Kashi and Kiba were feverishly pursing the fleeing Dadara. Kiba was almost certain he felt another presence nearby when they left the cave, but Kakashi had reminded him that they needed to focus on the task at hand. But he just couldn't shake the feeling that something else was out there. Kiba look out. Kakashi shouted. Kiba snapped back to reality to see two clay canaries flying straight at him. He grunted as he kicked Akamaru in the side, who barely missed the explosive projectiles. After recovering, the Inuzuka duo quickly fell in step behind Kakashi again. Kiba focus. He's an S-rank missing nin and he won't hesitate to kill you, Kakashi reprimanded the young ninja. That's sorry Kakashi-sensei, Kiba said sheepishly. Adara was annoyed when the leaf nin caught up with him, but now he was highly irked that he couldn't shake them. The little one and his mutt kept launching at him with some weird cyclone jutsu, and when he flew high up the silver-haired one would cast a strange space-time jutsu at him that sucked in everything nearby. He had already lost his remaining arm to that damnable technique. He was now speeding away as fast as he could, but no matter how hard he tried, the leaf nin. Adara saw a large grassy plain approaching and decided that's where he would make his stand. Swept low to the ground and hopped off, sliding to a stop. The giant bird deposited Gara's cold body beside him before swinging back around and making a beeline for his pursuers. The Kashi cursed at the clay bird headed straight for them. There was no time to dodge and even if there was, it would just explode and they would be caught in the blast. As the bird drew closer, Kakashi activated his Manjikam Sharingan. The ballistic animal exploded a mere 10 feet from them, and they were headed straight for the blast. With great precision, a little luck, and possibly the slightest hint of divine intervention, Kakashi activated his jutsu in the middle of the explosion, which in turn sucked into another dimension. Adara growled when he saw that damn space-time jutsu eat his explosion, and his pursuers landed safely on the far side of the field, though the taller one was barely holding up. Damn it stop following me. Why are you guys so persistent, yeah? Dadara shouted at the trio. They bust back Gara you worthless Akatsuki trashed. Kiba yelled back. Dadara was almost seething at that moment. The little leaf punk was working his last nerve. He decided to try and get under his skin. This worthless thing. Dadara said kicking Gara's body, eliciting a growl from Kiba. Why do you want it? We've already sucked out his tailed beast, he informed them. The Kashi's face stiffened. 
His comment made him remember what Chio had said about Jinchkriki on the way to the hideout. If a tailed beast is extracted from its Jinchkriki, then the host will die. Adar watched as realization hit them like a brick wall. A smirk found its way to his face as he continued to beleaguer his enemies. Best that means you understand now, yeah. He's nothing more than a lifeless husk now. Dadara cackled. Tiba could no longer contain his anger. He took out a food pills and gave one to himself and Akamaru, causing his fur to turn an angry red. Ninja art of beast mimicry. All fours Jutsu Kiba dropped down to all fours as his nails and canine teeth elongated, giving him a more feral appearance. He let out an angry howl before he and Akamaru took off in a burst of speed. Bakashi stayed behind panting and trying to catch his breath. It was bad enough that his normal Sharingan drained his chakra constantly, but using his Manjikam and its techniques like that repeatedly was suicidal. He would succumb to chakra exhaustion any moment now. Adara cursed when saw the dog boy and his mutt charging at him at insane speeds. He rolled under a roundhouse only to be head-butted by Akamaru. Dadara stumbled back and had little time to regain his balance before Kiba was in his face, again throwing kicks and slashes with those troublesome claws of his. He just kept dodging and backpedaling, waiting for an opening to counterattack. Kiba's rage grew and blinded him even more with each missed strike. Even with his enhanced speed, the Nukunin's reflexes proved to be too much for him. Fang over Fang. Kiba and Akamaru began rotating at extreme speeds, forming twin cyclones that converged on the missing Nin. Adara cursed as felt one of the cyclones scraped against his side, and he was frantically leaping around the field to avoid being shredded to death. I panted as he slid to a stop. He looked over to Chio to see that the elderly woman wasn't faring any better. Shortly after they literally shattered the third Kazakiage puppet through the efforts of their teamwork, Sasori unveiled his true form. He had turned himself into a human puppet which was the secret behind his youthful appearance. Then he released his ultimate technique that earned him his title as Sasori of the Red Sand. In order to counter his performance of a hundred puppets, Chio was forced to use the Chikamatsu collection of ten puppets, and Guy unlocked the first four of the eight gates. They battled for what seemed like hours, slowly dwindling the numbers of Sasori's puppets, while dodging random bursts of flames from Sasori himself. The destruction caused by their battle was enough to level the roof of the cave and obliterate most of the surrounding walls. With their number cut down to about 60, Guy decided to go for a technique he was sure to eliminate the rest. Six Gate of Joy, open. Air and chakra swirled around Guy in a maelstrom. A shockwave of the combined energies exploded from his position as he jumped high into the air. Sasori saw this and converged all his remaining puppets on his opponent's position in the sky. I don't know what you're planning, but I'll stop you before you get a chance to execute your plans. He shouted at the green-clad ninja. But he was too late. Guy had already taken his stance. Asa Kujaku. Guy let loose a barrage of punches against the puppets heading towards him. His hands were moving so fast that his fists were set ablaze by mere speed and friction. Sasori watched in anger as the last of his puppets were destroyed by what looked like fireballs shooting from the green ninja's hands. Chiyo used Guy's attack as a distraction to make her move. Her grandson's lack of attention gave her all the time she needed to launch her attack. One of her puppets dropped a small white ball into her hands which she launched at the younger puppet user. Lion-headed cannon. The small ball expanded into a giant lion head laced with many sharp fangs. Sasori noticed the giant head flying towards him, but reacted too late to keep it from slamming into him and pinning him against the wall. Ceiling technique. Lion closing roar. A ceiling formula in the shape of a diamond formed around Sasori and sealed away all his chakra. His limp body stuck to the wall behind the lion head. I crashed back down back to the ground after he finished his technique and was knocked out of the eight gates. He lay motionless in the crater he made fighting to stay awake. We did it. We defeated our opponent, and flames of youth grow stronger because of this, especially Uchiyo Basama, he panted. Gio chuckled at his expense, and the two remained there in silence enjoying the peace of the moment. Neither of them expected a blade to suddenly pierce Guy's abdomen. Guy snapped his eyes open to see an unharmed Sasori standing over him holding the sword that was dug into his stomach. You two are troublesome, Sasori said in his usual stoic tone. He twisted the sword in his hand, making Guy cry out in pain. Chiyo stood back shuddering in fear. I am possible. Your chakra should be sealed. You shouldn't be able to move. She turned to see where his body should be, but was even more confused to see it anchored to the wall, the seal still in place. She gaze snapped between the body and the Sasori, before trying to decipher what exactly was happening. Her eyes widened as the answer came to her. Sasori smirked when he saw the look of realization upon his grandmother's face. I see you figured it out grandmother. Be the core in your chest. That's your human element. You truly are puppet. You ejected your core at the last second and switched bodies. You hid amongst the rubble of your puppets and waited for us to let our guard down. She said. And now, he began as he pulled his blade from Guy's body. You shall both die. 
he raised his sword above his head and brought it down on Guy's helpless prone figure. Guy closed his eyes and waited for the Shinigami to take him. He flinched as blood splattered onto his face, yet he felt no new wound on his figure. He opened his eyes and was grateful at the sight before him. Tsusori stood over him, his sword mere inches from his torso. He was frozen in place with a look of utter horror on his fate. Guy searched over him with his eyes and found the reason for his discomfort. Long sword extending through the core in Sasori's chest and blood dripped down the blade onto Guy. The wielder of the blade was none other than Kurunai. Kurunai let out a sigh of relief. She made it in the nick of time. When she had seen Sasori get stapled to the wall with Chiyo's jutsu, she was tempted to drop her jinjutsu and rejoin her comrades. But when she saw Sasori sneaking up on him, she saw it as an opportunity to take down the assailant. She picked up a sword from one of his puppets and used it to slay him after she heard Chiyo explain his weakness. I am possible, Sasori stammered before slumping down to the earth, void of all life. Kurunai-san, your skills in Jinjutsu is the source of your exuberant flames of youth. I am most grateful for the save. He laughed. It was short-lived as his laughter quickly turned to coughs and cries of pain. Ai-san. Kurunai was instantly at his side assessing his wounds. He's been poisoned, Chio said as she knelt down beside Guy. Unfortunately, Sasori was the benefactor of the poison, and only he knows the cure. So we're just gonna sit here and let him die. Kurina yelled. No, not necessarily. I think I know something that might work, Chio said before going through a series of hand signs. One's own life reincarnation jutsu. Kurunai watched on in awe as the older woman placed her hands, encompassed by a blue aura, over Guy's torso. She looked on as toxic purple liquid seeped from the wound in Guy's abdomen, before closing up with a hiss. The aura around Chio's hands dissolved and she fell backwards, but was caught by Kurunai. Kurunai held the older woman and reminisced about the technique she had just witnessed. That jutsu just now it was just like Tsunade Sama's. No something about it was different. I awoke several minutes later feeling more rejuvenated than he ever had felt in his entire life. When he heard himself being addressed, he turned his head to meet eyes with Kurunai. It's good to see you're alright Gai-san. Yes, I feel great. It would appear that my flames of youth burned so brightly that the poison flowing through my veins was incinerated. This just goes to show you how strong the power of youth can be. He exclaimed. Chiyo chuckled and Kurunai rolled his eyes at his proclamation. Guy's demeanor suddenly became serious. But there is no time to dilly-dally my most youthful comrades. Me must move out and retrieve the Kazakiage before my eternal rival. I will prove now that my flames of youth are greater than Kakashi's. I shall not be beaten. He yelled as he dashed out of the cave. I sand, this is a serious mission, not a completion. Kurunai yelled as she ran after him, leaving a tired, slower-moving Chiyo behind. Young people these days simply no patience at all, she huffed as she picked up speed. Adara felt himself growing tired as he continued to evade Kiba's attack. Just as he was on the verge of collapsing, he noticed that his attackers were slowing down and figured they must be just as tired as him. This was the time to strike. Kiba felt his stamina and chakra draining quickly as he kept up his jutsu. He decided to end it and switch back to tojutsu. After all, his opponent didn't have any arms to counter him. The moment Kiba stopped spinning, Dadara rushed forward and kneed him in his solar plexus, forcing all traces of oxygen in his lungs out of the younger boy's body. Kiba doubled over and fell to the ground trying to regain control over his breathing. Akamaru saw his partner's predicament and launched at Dadara, only to meet a kick to the head and fall into dark clutches of unconsciousness. Kiba was still on the ground trying to breathe effectively, only to have a foot slam into his diaphragm and knock out any air he had regained. Dadara smirked as he looked down at the helpless boy under his feet. You're annoying you know that. Let's see how handle one of my strongest C2 techniques, yeah. After he was through speaking, his body began to swell and distort to bulbous proportions. With this, I'll become art. Not that everlasting crap that Sasori Senpai speaks of, but something beautiful and instantaneous, for art is an explosion. Kiba was overloaded with fear. He still couldn't breathe, and he was powerless under his enemy's foot. Seconds from doomsday, his mind was swarmed with regrets. Mom, Hana I'm sorry. I can't follow in dad's footsteps and become clan head. I let my team down. Shino Kurunai sensei I'm sorry. And Hinata I never got to tell you how I feel. Bakashi struggled in vain to stand. He lacked the necessary chakra to use Kamui, and his body refused to follow his commands. And to make matters worse, the cold grasp of unconsciousness was trying to overtake his mind. Once again, he was powerless to save a comrade. History seems to keep repeating itself on me. First Ibido, then Rin, Minato-sensei, Naruto and Sasuke, and now this. I've failed once again I guess this is where I meet my end. Adara smiled as he reached the apex of his growth. Now you will see what true art is. Die Leaf Shinobi. Kiba winced and shut his eyes tightly, waiting for this harbinger of destruction to send him to the afterlife. 
He waited with bated breath for the sound of the explosion to envelope his ears, but it never came. Instead, he heard the sound of wind whipping and flesh tearing. He opened his eyes to see Dadara quivering. Impossible. I should have exploded. I should have become art. Dadara's lower half fell backwards, while his upper body slumped to the side and fell to the ground, revealing the slash from his right shoulder to his left hip that bisected him. But Dadara's body removed from view, Kiba caught a glimpse of his savior. His back is turned to him and he was crouching low to the ground. Beneath his billowing black cloak he could make out a red coat that was held in place by an orange rope belt that was tied around his waist that also held what he presumed was a red sword sheath. His right arm was poised behind him and he held a red hilted chokin. Small golden sparks danced across his blade. The man stood tall again revealing his bright blonde hair. Wind whipped through his hair and brought his fragrance to Kiba. The young Inuzuka was awestruck by the scent. It was vaguely familiar. It smelled faintly of pine and the forest that was overshadowed by the smell of snakes and blood. A memory long suppressed by despair and time rose to the surface. There was only one person he knew that smelled like that. The man before him still had yet to turn around. The only movement he made was sheathing his sword and his hair was flowing with the wind. After a few moments, he let out a deep sigh and spoke as he turned around. It's been a while hasn't it Kiba? Kiba barely contained himself from going into shock. The blonde hair, sky blue eyes, and the whisker marks that adorned his cheeks. The scent made sense now. Kiba stuttered in fear as he finally found his voice. And Naruto, is that really you? Chapter 4. Old friends, new circumstances. Takashi stared in disbelief across the field. He was positive that standing over the prone figure of Kiba was his long lost blonde charge. Kakashi was dumbstruck. Naruto was missing for three years and left no kind of trace, but here he stood not 30 feet away from him. His attire underwent a major change and he was much taller, but he was still Naruto. Kiba was just as shocked as Kakashi. Here stood one of his missing comrades thought to be dead, alive and well. Maybe it's all a dream yep, that's exactly what it is. This is all one big joke from Kami that he pulled on everyone when they got to heaven. Kiba was far from amused. Haha very funny Kami. What kind of way is that to welcome someone to heaven? Kiba shouted to the sky. Naruto eyed the brunette boy quizzically. Kiba what the hell are you talking about? Naruto asked in a flat tone. Don't play coy with me. I know you're in on it. Just because you changed clothes doesn't mean you're not the same prankster we all know. You and Kami-sama thought it'd be funny to mess with me when I got to heaven. Well it won't work. Kiba retorted. What joke is he talking about? Naruto thought to himself. Kiba, I think you've spent too much time in the sun, shut it Yuzumaki. Just tell Kami-sama to come out already. You're not dead you idiot. You're the idiot. I was freaking under a bomb that exploded at point blank range. How can I not be dead? Kiba yelled as he found his way back to his feet. You mean that bomb? Naruto asked motioning to the bisected body of Dadara, which was now chalky white in color, revealing it to be a clay clone. He then took a step toward Kiba and flicked him in the forehead. Ow. What the hell was that for? Kiba growled. If you were dead, that wouldn't hurt idiot. Realization soon overcame Kiba. He didn't explode into a million tiny pieces, he didn't die, and he hasn't been pranked by Naruto in heaven. Wait, Naruto's here, which means, oh my god, Naruto you're alive. Kiba shouted pointing an accusing finger at the blonde. That's generally the case when I'm standing here breathing just like you. Naruto replied stoically. Kiba ignored the sarcasm in his tone. Do you know what this means Naruto? You can finally come home. What will everyone think? Tsunade Sam is gonna have a heart attack and Sakura just might hyperventilate. But who cares? You'll be back home and you can be a ninja again, and you can see all our friends again, and eat tons of ramen at Ichiraku, and, no, what? I said no, Naruto reiterated. What do you mean no? Kiba asked. No as in I'm not going back to Konoha, Naruto said plainly. Why the hell not? You have to come back. Kiba nearly shouted. Naruto narrowed his eyes, and Kiba winced at the dark tone of his voice as he spoke. I don't have to do a damn thing. Why the hell should I go back? Because Naruto, you have friends and people that love and care about you. So? There's also people there that despise my very existence for something out of my control. Naruto shot back. Kiba cast his friend a sympathetic look. It was true that people used to alienate Naruto just because he held the kickbee. They only saw him the demonic beast that wiped out their village instead of the bright, hyperactive kid that held it. But things weren't like that anymore. Naruto you're not the kickbee. And people don't think of you as such anymore. People changed. You gotta come back, Kiba tried to reassure him. Naruto's scowl only deepened. Give me three reasons why I should consider coming back. All of your friends miss why, has. Naruto interrupted him. Kiba flinched at his uncaring tone. Tsunade Sama greatly misses you. She nearly fell into a depression after you disappeared. We just want to see her happy again. We want to see you happy. Next. 
Kiba felt his anger starting to boil at the blonde's impassiveness. So you're just going to leave your father's legacy behind. Naruto raised an eyebrow at that. His was interested peaked. Kiba, everyone knows I'm an orphan, I have no parents. What the hell are you talking about? Kiba smirked. Maybe this would be enough to convince him. After you left, the villagers began to have festivals in honor of your departure. Kiba saw the scowl on Naruto's face grow more intense and decided to hurriedly explain before the situation got out of control. Tsunade Sama tried to put a stop to it, but the council wouldn't let her. So as a way of getting back at them, she gathered everyone in the center of the village and told everyone of your heritage and what really happened the night the Kikbi attacked. Naruto, you're the son of Konoha's greatest heroes, the fourth Hokage himself. Kiba felt his stomach churn when Naruto's face went stoic again. Kiba, lying is going to help your argument, Naruto said flatly. I'm not lying. Tsunade said so herself. You can ask anyone. The villagers stop throwing festivals and most feel bad about the way they treated you, Kiba argued. Let's say I believe you, Kiba. You expect me to go back to a place where I was utterly hated with open arms because they said they apologized. Sorry, not gonna happen. The damage is done and I'm not gonna go back just so they can swoon over me because of my heritage. And as far as I'm concerned, if the fourth really is my father, then he can burn in hell. Kiba's anger was beginning to surface. Naruto you're being unreasonable. Kiba yelled. Naruto hung his head and his hair draped over his now hidden eyes. I'm being unreasonable. No, Kiba you're the unreasonable one. I was openly despised, no one gave me the time of day, and I damn near lost my fucking life on to many occasions to count. If you really cared about my happiness, then you would understand exactly why I refused to go back to that cursed place. You guys don't miss me. You miss the idiot that made you all laugh and some you could make fun of. You're all selfish and I refuse to be that person anymore. I'm gonna follow my own path. Find yourself another class clown because I'm done. Kiba was at his boiling point. If his friend wasn't going to listen to reason then he was just gonna have to use force. But before he could even make a move, something whizzed past his head and he heard the loud clang of metal hitting metal. He looked up to see Naruto, who was refitted with his uninterested mask again, holding his sword in front of his face and two kunai falling to the ground. He turned around to see who the mystery assailant was. Fenton made her way towards Kakashi and Kiba's last reported location. After disposing of her to Pelginger, she left to find her comrade since she was closest while Hinata left to regroup. Kakashi had reported over the headset that they were pursuing a man with blonde hair and a black coat. The man was with Akatsuki and was in possession of the Kazakiage. So naturally, when she finally caught up to them and saw Kiba standing across from a blonde man in a black cloak, she attempted to take him out. But her attack was foiled when then man pulled out a sword and swatted her kunai away like flies. They said he rode on an oversized pigeon as Kiba put it and made clay animals that he could make explode. They neglected to mention he had a sword and a very nice one at that. She landed in the clearing next to Kiba who gave her a confused look. Denton. What are you doing here? He asked. I here to back you guys up stupid. Is this the guy? She asked unsealing a kusari gama. Um, not exactly Kiba replied. Not exactly. What the hell Kiba, is this the guy or not? She raised her voice. She took another look at the blonde man and absorbed his appearance. Spiky blonde hair, ocean blue eyes, three whisker marks on each cheek, wait what? She knew of only one person that fit that description. And Naruto? Impossible you're supposed to be dead, she asked hesitantly. Her answer was a glare directed at her. Why the hell does everyone think I'm dead? Kanoha's spy network must be lacking if they believe me to be dead, he said. Denton was confused at first, but then excitement quickly washed over. Wait you're alive. Now you can come back home and- Not gonna happen, Naruto interrupted. What? Why? Tenten asked confused. Because he still has animosity towards the village for the way they treated him. He doesn't believe that things have changed, Kiba explained. Tenten was left dumbstruck by the information and Naruto took this time to voice his intentions. Look, meeting you guys here was nice and everything, but I can't stay. I only came to save Gara. But it seems I was too late, Naruto said with a downcast look. But as fast as it came, the sadness left him and he looked straight ahead at them again. The best I can do now is return his body to Suna, and that's exactly what I'm going to do so if you would excuse me, Naruto said as he turned away from the bewildered pair. He didn't make it very far before he had to somersault away to avoid an incoming attack. The ground where he once stood exploded and a cloud of dirt and debris shot up. When the dust cleared, he saw Lee with his foot planted firmly in the middle of the mini crater, casting a glare in his direction. He also he movement behind him and turned his head to find Gara's body missing. He turned back around to find it being held by Shino, who stood beside Kiba. In the clearing now stood Shino, Hinata holding a still unconscious Akamaru, Kurunai, Chio, Niji, and Guy who was supporting an exhausted Kakashi. They were all casting glares at Naruto. Lee was the first to speak. 
You will not prevail in your unyouthful schemes this day. The green-clad ninja exclaimed. Naruto just stared at him in disinterest. Lee did a double take on the man before him. He couldn't possibly be Naruto. He asked. Lee, Naruto replied. Lee's eyes widened in excitement. Naruto, my most youthful friend it really is you. Everyone behind him except Kiba, Tenten, Kakashi, and Chiyo gasped. The older woman was confused at everyone's bewilderment. Naruto, is that really you? I thought you died, Niji asked stepping forward. Naruto's face deadpanned and didn't grace him with a response. I was really annoying that everyone thought he was dead. I don't have time for this. Just hand over Gara's body and I'll be on my way, Naruto said to the large group before him. Everyone looked as his like he'd grown another head except Kiba, who had dropped into his tojutsu stance. Sorry, can't do that Naruto. You're coming with us. Kiba said to the blonde across from him, who remained emotionless. What's the meaning of this Kiba? Why are you attacking Naruto? Niji asked the younger ninja. Naruto refuses to return to Konoha peacefully. If that's the case, then it is our duty to capture him and bring him back ourselves. He is a missing nin after all, he said simply. Everyone looked at him with shocked faces, then turned to Naruto. Naruto, is this true? Kakashi asked in a hoarse voice. Yes and I've made up my mind, the blonde replied. He raised an eyebrow as he watched Niji, Tenten, and Lee slip into their own battle stances. So this is how it's gonna be huh he said to no one in particular. He removed his sword from its sheath and held it in its usual reverse grip. I don't want to hurt you guys, Naruto warned them. Kiba scoffed at his remark. Hurt us. You're outnumbered four to one. You should be more worried about yourself. Kiba, don't underestimate your opponent, especially someone like Naruto. He wasn't Kanoha's most unpredictable ninja for nothing you know. I highly doubt he's been sitting around idly for the last three years, Niji berated him. You should listen to him Kiba, Naruto began, that Inuzuka arrogance of yours will get you killed one day. Kiba snarled at him. The blonde dead last was definitely going to get it now. But come on Niji, it Naruto were talking about. He can't be all that powerful can he? Tenten asked. This earned her a glare from said blonde. Big talk for a plain Jane Kinoichi like yourself. Tenten right eye twitched in annoyance. Oh he's definitely going down, she growled. Yosh. I will finally get to test my flames of youth against a worthy opponent and bring my most youthful friend home. Lee exclaimed excitedly. Lee calm down, don't just rush in. We need a plan, Niji said. Oh shut up Niji and let's get this over with already. Kiba shouted and rushed forward to engage his old friend. I'm kinda with wit Kiba on this one, Tenten said as she ran forward spinning her Kusari Gama. Yosh. Lee shouted as he followed their suit. Niji grumbled something incoherent about brash younger ninjas and a lack of tact before rushing forward. Naruto didn't even flinch as the four ninja flocked towards him. Kiba reached him first and slashed out at him with elongated claws. Naruto merely sidestepped and with his open hand, grabbed Kiba by the wrist and flung him away effortlessly. He then immediately raised his sword to block a strike from the sickle of Tenten's chain side. She snatched the sickle back to her hand and quickly closed the distance between them. She lashed out at him vigorously, intent on making him regret ever calling her plain Jane Naruto, swiftly dodge all of her strikes, earning a growl from the brunette. He enjoyed putting to use his training in the art of evasion Orochimaru had put him and Sasuke through. He claimed that they needed to swift if they wanted to survive his training regimen. They figured he was bluffing, but quickly learned how serious he was after coming within a centimeter of death on multiple occasions. He also incorporated it into his fighting style. He was laid back when he fought and just dodged his opponent's strikes, waiting for the right chance to counterattack, which is exactly what he was doing to the flustered brunette Kinoichi before him. Damn it stop moving you slippery little bastard. She yelled as she swung at his neck. Sure Tenten, I'll just stand here and let you hack me into little tiny pieces. Sounds delightful, he said deflecting another attempt at his stomach. Tenten was not amused by his sarcasm, and she swung with more ferocity. Fight me like a man Naruto. That's just it, I'm not a man. I'm only 16. Now calm down Tenten before I'm forced to retaliate. I really hate the idea of hitting a girl, and I don't want that on my conscience for the rest of the day, Naruto responded. Tenten was even more intent on striking down the blonde where he stood. He had just played the gender card, the utmost insulting thing for a Kinoichi. He was undermining her skills and would now pay dearly for it. Naruto calmly blocked and evaded Tenten's attacks, now fueled with blind rage. He was biding his time and waiting for an opening all the while trying to keep his head intact. Seeing the chance he was looking for after a failed downward slash at his shoulder, he slammed his blade down with pinpoint precision into one of the links of her weapon's chain. Tenten cursed as her weapon was pinned to the ground. Naruto had succeeded in breaking her usual level-headed demeanor and sent her into a blind fury. She was now paying for that mistake. She tried to pull her weapon free along with Naruto's sword, but he had a firm grip on it. 
Using his sword arm and right leg as a pivot, Naruto swung his other leg out and launched a kick at the brown-haired Kinoichi. Cutting her losses, Tenten abandoned her weapon and flipped away. She had to calm down and regain composure before engaging him again. Naruto's senses picked up movement behind him and he ducked under the incoming attack. Lee had gotten behind Naruto while Tenten engaged him in a deadly dance. Using the element of surprise, he attempted to end the fight quickly with a well-placed kick to the head. Unfortunately, Naruto ducked under it and he hit nothing but air. Leaving his sword in the ground, Naruto spun around quickly in his crouched position and grabbed Lee's grounded leg. Utilizing his opponent's unbalanced stance, Naruto shot upward and flipped Lee off the ground. Naruto immediately delivered a roundhouse to the boy's chest while he was still in midair and sent Lee flying. Sensing another presence behind him, Naruto prepared to face his next opponent. Niji rushed forward to face the blonde. His surprise attack failed when Naruto turned and deflected his strike. Niji kept launching gentle fist strikes at him, and Naruto just backpedaled as the Haika pressed on. This is exactly what Niji wanted. He had to distance Naruto away from his sword. From what he had observed so far, he was quite adept in Kenjutsu and would prove to be a most troublesome opponent with it in his possession. Naruto frowned as more distance was put between him and his sword. It was obvious that Niji had analyzed his capabilities with it and was trying to prevent him from using it. He cursed as he felt a Tenketsu in his forearm clothes. He had to counter Niji and quick less he wanted to end up in a near vegetative. Niji pressed on in his assault, waiting for the blonde to slip up. He couldn't dodge forever and when he tired, he would just close the necessary Tenketsu and render him motionless. Lakta seemed to be on his side as he saw Naruto slip in a particular patch of grass and lose balance. Now's my chance. Gentle fist art. 8 trigram 64 palms. Niji called out as he rushed the helpless blonde. 2 palms. 2 Tenketsu in Naruto's left shoulder closed. 4 palms. Another 4 near his right lung shut down. 8 palms. And octative hits landed home on his abdomen. 16 palms. More strikes rained down on his upper arms. 30 palms. A barrage of blows found their marks all across Naruto's torso. 8 trigram 64 palms. Niji shouted as he slammed his hand against Naruto's sternum and ended his assault. However, he didn't count on the Naruto before him to poof in a white cloud of smoke. A shadow clone. But when? His only answer was an emotionless voice behind him. My turn, wind style. Beast wave gale palm. A large massive chakra flowed from Naruto's hand. It took the shape of a demonic hand and shot forward. Niji looked wide-eyed as the attack approached him. Eight trigrams palms rotation. Niji called out as he released chakra from Tenketsu all over his body and began to spin rapidly, forming a circular protective shell. Naruto's jutsu slammed into the side of Niji's chakra dome and they violently grinded against each other. Niji pumped out more chakra and spun faster to push against the destructive blast of wind that seemed to want nothing more than to break through his defenses and tear him to shreds. After what seemed forever and a day, the two jutsu cancelled each other out and dissipated, leaving behind a heavily panting Niji. His clothes were littered with cuts from small blades of wind that managed to slip through. He cast a glare at the blonde across from him. Is that all you got? Niji asked smugly as he resettled into his fighting stance. Naruto smirked and charged at the wavering Haikta. Hinata was conflicted as she watched the scene before her develop. She was shocked that Naruto was there, happy that he wasn't dead, sad that he wouldn't come back home, and scared as she watched her friends fight. Her emotions were having an all-out war within her, and she had no idea what to do. There was only one clear thought in her mind throughout all this. Naruto-kun he's really alive. Chiyo looked up from her kneeling position beside Gara to observe the battle. She was puzzled as to why the younger ninja were fighting against someone they called friend. She concluded that he must be a missing nin. Young people these days with their quest for power she grumbled to herself before returning to the task at hand. Gara was indeed dead, but she would soon remedy that. She was using her reincarnation technique to revive the fallen leader. Sure the cost was her life, but she felt she owed it to him. If she hadn't sealed Shukaku into his as a baby in the first place, then the boy wouldn't have died at the beast's expense. All was going smoothly as she held her chakra inkist hands over Gara's corpse. But there was one sight problem. Not enough chakra, Chiyo panted as the aura around her hands became unstable. If she couldn't finish the technique now, then she would have to wait for her chakra to replenish, and by the time that happens, Gara's soul will have already left the mortal plane. Chiyo tried desperately to continue the jutsu by using every bit of chakra that she could muster. But I was no use. She was about to give up hope until she felt a pair of warm hands cover her own. She raised her downtrodden gaze to see Kurinai giving her a warm smile. Take mine, Chiyo-sama. I have plenty left. Chiyo smiled at her gesture of kindness as she pulled on the younger woman's chakra. It would seem that Gara would live after all. Naruto growled as ducked under another swipe from Kiba's claws. 
The boy's speed and his bestial mentality made him a force to be reckoned with, a fact Naruto knew all too well from the Chiknin exam preliminaries three years prior. Naruto was losing ground in this fight. He was outnumbered and they were making a great effort to keep him away from his sword. He didn't want to hurt them, but there was no other choice if he wanted to make it out of this. This is getting tedious. I have to end this. Sidestepping a punch aimed at his stomach, Naruto stepped in close to Kiba's guard. He delivered a powerful knee to his solar plexus, then grabbed Kiba by the back of the head and drove his other knee straight into his face, knocking him out instantly. Naruto gently laid his body on the ground before jumping away to avoid a slash across his back. Naruto faced his assailant to see Tenten lunging and slicing at him. And she was using his sword. Tenten smirked as she attacked the elusive blonde. He sure had a hell of a weapon, one that she planned to keep for herself after he was caught as a way of replacing the one he broke. C kept swinging at Naruto trying to disable him in any kind of way. C saw her chance when he stumbled slightly. Tenten smirked and lunged forward at his abdomen. Little does she know that would be her undoing. Naruto smirked when he saw Tenten fall for his feint. At the last possible second, he spun his body around the blade and grabbed the hilt with his left hand. He continued to twist his body and slammed his right elbow into the base of her neck. Her grasp on his sword loosened, and he never saw the look of surprise and horror as she fell into a deep slumber. Naruto heard footsteps approaching him, and he turned to see Lee running full speed at him. Naruto gave the boy credit for his endurance and determination, but he had to end the battle quickly. The blonde stuck his sword in the ground before flipping through three hand signs and inhaling deeply. Wind style. Unrelenting force. Naruto exhaled and a powerful gust of wind exploded from his mouth. Lee skidded to a stop when he felt the blast of wind approaching him and braced himself. Unfortunately for him, it wasn't enough. The gust slammed into Lee with unimaginable power and sent him catapulting backwards where he slammed into a tree at the edge of the clearing and lost consciousness. Niji stared in awe as Naruto's jutsu launched his teammate across the field. This definitely was not the idiotic blonde he fought in the finals three years ago. Even when outnumbered, he was making short work of them. It's almost as if he wasn't even trying before now. Niji growled and pulled out a kunai before making a mad dash for the blonde, intending on ending the battle once and for all. Naruto felt the killer intent focused on him, and he saw Niji, kunai in hand, barreling across the field straight at him. Only one left Naruto thought as he picked up his sword. He sprinted straight at Niji to meet him head on, both boys with the same thought in mind. Time to end this. Time slowed as they drew closer and closer. Both held the weapons poised to attack. It was only a matter of time before the met and the inevitable happened. But it never did. Naruto ran at the Haikyo but was too engrossed in the current situation to pick up the other presents heading for him. By the time he did, it was too late. He cursed himself for being careless and waited for someone to blindside him. Instead, said person just slammed into his chest, stopping him movements and wrapped their arms around his torso. When his confusion finally passed and his senses caught up to him, he noticed the person beneath him was shaking, and a faint salty smell was caught by his nose, and the sound of crying rang in his ears. He turned his gaze downward to see Hinata pressed against his body, sobbing into his chest. Her whole body quivered as she cried into him. Naruto was still in shock at the sudden and random act of the usually shy and timid Haikta. Then Naruto kun no more pee please no more, Hinata pleaded to the taller boy. She was tired of seeing her friends fighting and wanted to put a stop to it. She didn't want anyone to get hurt anymore. She just did the first thing that came to mind, and that was to embrace Naruto in hope of calming the boy down. Naruto was taken aback. First there was the sudden contact, then she pleaded to him as she cried her heart out, and now there was this fluttery feeling in his chest. He couldn't explain it, only it was just so warm and comforting. He never felt like this before, it was all too foreign to him, but he enjoyed it. He was brought out of his thoughts when Hinata gripped him tighter, and her sobs filled his ears once more. His caring nature took over as he hesitantly wrapped his arms around the smaller girl and pulled her closer. Hinata gasped when she felt him return her embrace, but her shock was quickly replaced with content as she relaxed against him. So warm Hinata sighed contently. This was another feeling foreign to Naruto. He had received hugs before, but none like this. He felt so at peace as Hinata relaxed against him, like they were the only ones left in the world. No hateful villagers, no scornful parents, and no looming threat of danger on the horizon. For the first time in a long while, Naruto was actually somewhat happy. Unfortunately, said happiness was shortly lived. He was too absorbed in his intimacy with Hinata to notice her cousin sneak up behind him. He did however feel the chop to the back of the neck that knocked him out. Damn it I got careless were Naruto last thoughts before everything went black. Hinata was so deeply enjoying the close contact with her lost love that she was caught off guard when she felt all his weight collapse on her. Both unceremoniously fell to the ground in a heap. Hinata blushed when she looked down to see Naruto resting peacefully on her chest. 
C cast her gaze upwards to see her cousin standing over them on shaking knees and breathing heavily. Niji was surprised, to say the least, at his younger cousin's intervention. It was totally unorthodox and out of character coming from the shy girl, but it did give him the perfect chance to take down Naruto. Had she not distracted the blonde, he would have been overpowered in no time, and Naruto would have escaped. Niji was swaying as he tried to keep on his feet. He had used quite a bit of chakra in, and that alongside all the blows he took, and the soreness from blocking left him worn out. He stole one last glance down at his cousin, who was still holding the sleeping blonde closely. Seeing that he wasn't waking up anytime soon, and that the Jinin would take care of the situation, he left fatigue claim him and fell to the ground. Gurunai had watched the whole altercation from her position beside Chiyo. She too was surprised at her student's actions, but it quickly wore off as she remembered how much she cared for her friends and a certain blonde-haired missing Min. At the same time, Chiyo felt the body growing weaker and heavier as her jutsu neared completion. Thoughts of her brother, her son and his wife, and even her grandson filled her head. She had no regrets and would soon be leaving this world to join them in the next. Though she did feel bad about leaving her brother all alone. This this time is for real, she said to herself as she thought about all the times she had played dead. With mere seconds to live, she turned her final thoughts to Gara. I'm so sorry for what I put you through. But now, I'm making amends and I hope you can find it in your heart to forgive me. Grow strong Gara and lead our people well. Though he might not admit it, your father would be proud the blue aura around her hands faded as she fell backwards, the last traces of life leaving her body. When Kurinai no longer felt the tug on her chakra, she turned back to see Chio collapsing, only to be caught by Guy, who gave her a reassuring smile. She figured that the older woman must have just been tired from using her technique in the fight earlier that day, and just needed rest. She stood up and almost lost her balance before quickly catching herself. Wow she took more chakra than I thought she did Kurinai thought to herself. Regaining her bearings, she took off towards the field where their fallen charges lay. She never caught the grim look on Guy's face when he finally felt how cold the woman in his arms was. Anada silently sat in the middle of the opening. She had readjusted herself and Naruto so that his head rested in her lap. She stared down at the boy beneath her as she hesitantly stroked his hair lovingly. He just looked so peaceful as he slept. She had also used this time to look over his changes. He was no longer the runt that was the same height as her. He had grown considerably and stood at least 5'6 while she herself was at 5'3. His blonde locks were still as bright as ever, and from the small glimpses she caught, his eyes still shone that heavenly shade of blue. His whisker marks intrigued her. No one knew exactly where they came from, but most figured it had something to do with the fox sealed within him. She lightly ran a finger across one, causing the sleeping blonde to flinch slightly before letting out a content sigh. She giggled. Who would have known his whiskers were so sensitive? That was quite a show there Hinata, a voice behind her said. Hinata stiffed and pulled Naruto closer to her and wrapped her arms around him protectively. Whoa easy there. Nothing's gonna happen, Kurinai said as she came into the younger girl's view. Hinata relaxed when she saw it was only her sensei. Kurinai noticed the position her student and her crush were in and grinned. That's one mighty grip you have there Hinata. You afraid he's gonna disappear or something? Kurinai teased. She smiled at how red in the red the young girl got. Hinata was feeling completely embarrassed right now. Her face was beet red and her cheeks were on fire. She hadn't realized the awkward position she had put herself in. She just wanted to protect Naruto. She actually did believe he would disappear any second, like this was all on Big Dream. She was really hoping it was real and just wanted to relish in the moment. She missed the loud ninja and didn't want to go back to a life without him. She loved him. But she was uncertain of his feelings toward her and it nearly crushed her when he said he didn't want to return to the village. She couldn't blame him with how he grew up and the way people treated him. But that's the past and things have changed now. He could return without prejudice. Gurunai saw the look on the girl's face and figured she was deep in thought. Probably thinking about the current situation with Naruto and what the future will bring. As Shinobi of Konoha, it was their duty to bring him back to the village since he was a missing nin. If only it could have been on more peaceful terms. Anada, Kurunai began, pulling the girl from her thoughts, you care about him a lot don't you? She asked. She was well aware of Hinata's deep affection for the boy. Hinata was hesitant to answer at first. She looked down at the sleeping figure in her lap, and a slight smile made its way to her face. I do Kurinai sensei I want nothing more than for him to return home to the village, Hinata said, never lifting her gaze. Kurinai gave a soft smile. But her smile quickly faded. I also want him to be happy. He deserves it the most. Even if even if that means never returning to Konoha again, small tears began to streak down her face. Kurinai felt her heart drop. The boy had been adamant about not coming back. Now they were dragging him back against his will, and there's telling what was bound to happen. She wasn't particularly happy with it, but it was their job. He was a missing nin and they have to capture him. 
She also didn't want to face the Hokage's wrath if she found out they ran into her favorite blonde charge and didn't make an attempt to bring him back. She actually sort of liked the boy. Even if he was loud, brash, hyperactive, and even annoying at times, he had a positive effect on her student. Because of him, Hinata had newfound confidence in herself and her abilities as a Kanoichi. She was still the shy and timid type, but she's slowly beginning to break out of that shell, just like she is now. Her and I knelt down and placed a hand on Hinata's shoulder, bringing the girl's troubled gaze to meet her own comforting one. Everything will be alright Hinata. Tsunade Sama will figure something out, Kurunai said with a reassuring smile. Hinata saw her sensei's smile and let one grace her own face as she looked back down at the sleeping figure beneath her and softly stroking his cheek. Maybe everything will be alright Hinata reassured herself. Chapter 5. Return to the Leaf. Shortly after Naruto's little showdown with his peers, the field was filled with a massive force of Sunanin sent as a search and rescue party. They arrived just in time to witness the Kazakiage waking up. They all let out cheers of excitement when they saw that their leader was safe. Tamari nearly choked the poor boy when she embraced him. Ara, on the other hand, was confused as to where he was and what exactly was happening. The last thing he remembered was being in a dark cave and having Chakra painfully ripped from his body. It was then Guy explained how Chiyo they tracked down the Akatsuki to their lair in the land of rivers, they split up after one made off with Gara's body. After they disposed of Sasori, they found Kiba, Kakashi, and most surprisingly Naruto. While Niji, Lee, Tenten and Kiba fought with Kiba after he refused to return peacefully, Chiyo Basama used a mysterious technique she called one's own life reincarnation jutsu on Gara to bring him back to life before falling asleep. Kankaram recognized the jutsu almost immediately. That's jutsu it's a forbidden technique. What are you talking about Kankaram? Tamari asked. It's a technique was developed by Chiyo Basama herself. It's designed to give life to puppets to greatly increase their combat efficiency, but at the cost of the user's life. I didn't know it could bring someone back from the dead, Kankram explained. Wait, you mean Chiyo Basama is Tamari said, leaving the question open as her gaze shifted from her brother to the small elderly woman in Guy's arms. Guy just dropped his head and her question was never given a response. Everyone knew the answer just by looking at her stiff, unmoving figure. Gara finally stood up and addressed his legion of charges. A moment of silence for Chiyo Sama. Almost immediately, everyone in attendance hung their head in respect for the old woman. She had given them back their leader and they would forever be grateful. After paying his respects, Gara raised his head and shifted his gaze across the field toward the sitting figure of Hinata and the blonde boy sleeping away with his head in her lap. Is that really Naruto? He asked aloud. As unbelievable as it is, yes that's him, Kakashi answered from his position next to Guy. Gara nodded and surveyed the bruised bodies of the four leaf nin resting before him. And he took them all down by himself. Gara asked disbelievingly. More like he wasn't even trying. He was obviously holding back until the end, and there's no telling how strong he is now. From what I've seen so far, his agility is amazing, and he's nothing short of a master with that sort of his. Hell, the only reason he was beaten was because of Hinata's sudden display of affection, which caught him off guard and gave Niji enough time to take him down, Kakashi explained. Ara raised a non-existent eyebrow at the part about his sudden display of affection, but nodded in understanding. What do you plan on doing with him? He asked. Well first, we were hoping to stay in Suna for a few days to recuperate. We're still pretty exhausted from taking on the Akatsuki, and Naruto really did a number on those four. After that we'll return to Konoha and take Naruto back with us. Ara just stared at the silver-haired Jinin, not giving a response. This made Kakashi stir uncomfortably. Gara's indifferent mask made him hard to read. After a few moments, Gara raised an arm, and a few ninja appeared at his side. Yes Kazuki Ajsama. Unasked. Gather up our leaf allies and help them back to Suna. Set them up in a hotel as well, Gara ordered. A collective yes sir. Was heard and they scattered to follow their leader's orders. They quickly collected up the four downed leaf nin, but had problems retrieving the last. Hinata was apprehensive about giving up Naruto. She just didn't trust them with him being a missing nin and all, and for all she knew, they might try to capitalize on his bounty. At least if he came back with them, he'd be returning with friends, albeit forcibly. She gripped Naruto a little tighter, but then Kurunai gave her a reassuring smile. It's okay Hinata, they're friends. Reluctantly, the brunette released her grip on the blonde, and he was whisked away with the rest of her friends. She really didn't want to leave his side, in fear that he would up and disappear again. So instead, she opted to traveling beside him. Within a few minutes, the Kazakiyaj and his rather large entourage departed from the land of river and made their way to the humble dwelling in the middle of the desert that they call home. Naruto was groggily brought back to the world of the living by a rough jerk of his body. The last thing he remembered was standing at the gates of Suna, bound in chains and covered in chakra-suppressing seals, before everything went black again. 
Ever since he had awoken in Suna the first time, he was constantly being knocked back out, which pissed him off greatly. Every time he awoke, just after he gathered his senses, it was lights out again. He didn't have time to come up with an escape plan, he was starving, and he was pretty certain it wasn't healthy for a person to be slipping in and out of consciousness on a regular basis like that. In fact, the longest he had ever been awake was when he had a private conversation with Gara sometime before they left. He'd been out so long weeks could have passed by for all he knew. Being smart about the situation, he decided to not alert his captors to his awakened state. The last thing he needed right now was another nap. Through half-lidded eyes, he tried to make out his surroundings. He was looking straight down at a pair of bright green legs, each clad in striped orange leg warmers. He figured that he was being carried, most likely slung over the person's shoulder. Judging from the height, green clothing, and orange leg warmers, it had to be Guy. Directly in front of him he heard the distinct voices of Lee and Tenton deep in conversation. This sword is amazing. Simple, yet beautiful at the same time. Tenton said as she admired Naruto's chakan. It is a most youthful weapon. Lee said from beside her. They were walking at a moderate pace directly behind Guy. Tenton ogled Naruto's blade while Lee walked alongside her holding its sheath. You know, I just might hold on to this, Tenton said as she ran her finger along the length of the sword's broadside. Tenton, stealing is most unyouthful. This sword belongs to Naruto-kun, and I don't think he would be happy about you taking his weapon. Besides, you have plenty of swords, Lee said to the brunette Kinoichi. Well tough cookies. He should have thought about that before he broke my Kusari Gama. I think of this as compensation. Besides, there's just something different about this one. Lee was right about one thing. Naruto was not happy. In fact, he was livid. The mere idea of someone he didn't trust touching his sword at any place other than the business end in live combat annoyed him. But this girl was not only manhandling his precious weapon, she even went as far as to claim that she was keeping it as her own. The sheer blasphemy that came from her mouth was enough to make his blood boil. Fenton was bust going over the craftsmanship of the sword in her hands when a wave of killer intent washed over her. She immediately looked ahead of her to where it originated, expecting to see an enemy poised to strike. Instead, she only met a pair of fiery blue red eyes glaring at her. She flinched at first, but then recognized their owner to be the blonde slung over her sensei's shoulder. A smirk quickly found its way to her face. Well, 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 look who finally woke up, Tenton said loud enough to get everyone's attention. Niji and Lee both snapped their gazes towards their sensei ahead of them and saw that Naruto was indeed awake. Damn, we still got quite some way till we get to Konoha. Oh well, guess it's lights out again for you, Kiba said as he raised his hand to bring it down upon the blonde's neck. Naruto mentally berated himself for getting caught. He let his anger get to him and he was about to be rewarded with another long nap. Just as Kiba's hand came close to his neck, a voice behind Naruto stopped the movement. Kiba, enough. He's been out long enough, give him some time to breathe. Knocking people out like that all the time isn't good for their health. Bringing back a long lost friend won't do any good if you give him health problems in the process. I don't need to explain what Tsunade Sama will do if she finds out you're the responsible for any defects Naruto might develop because of your actions, do I? Kurinai scolded him. Hiba did the math in his head. This off Tsunade plus super strength plus extraordinary medical skills equals never ending beat down. She could destroy his body him body beyond recognition and then put him back together just to do it all over again. This could go for as long as she wanted or at least until her chakra ran out. He definitely didn't want that problem. This is one of those times he was jealous of Naruto's closeness with the Hokage. She obviously favored the boy and cared for him greatly. It was evident when people caught her weeping after his disappearance when she thought no one was looking. But Kiba figured that if he couldn't knock him out, he would at least toy with Naruto. After all, he was powerless to stop him. HMPH, guess you're not so big and bad mister. I'm too good for Konoha. Kiba teased. He didn't receive a response or even acknowledgement that he was speaking. Naruto's disinterested mask had returned to his face and it didn't look like he was giving Kiba the time of day. This irked Kiba, but he decided to press on. Wow Naruto, I never thought of you as the breeding type. But I guess I would be too after I just got my ass handed to me by peers. Guess you're not really as strong as you thought you were. It's just like I said, we'd bring you back to Konoha by force if we had to. Now look at you. That's okay though, maybe one day you'll be an elite ninja like me, Kiba said smirking with pride. He looked at Naruto and saw that his expression had changed. He had a deadpan look plastered on his face and he was giving Kiba a blank stare. If you're a lead in Konoha, then I fear for the future of the village. Kiba you're about as a lead as a blade of grass. All bark and no bite. If I hadn't held back, I would have just killed you instead of tossing your pansy ass aside like a ragdoll, Naruto said. Kiba was red in the face with anger and he had no retorts. Unfortunately, there was some truth to his words, even if he didn't want to admit it. Naruto heard Tenten giggling in the background and shifted his attention to her. 
What are you laughing at plain Jane? You're no better than he was. You lost your temper and just rushed in with blinded fury. I could have cut you down 18 different times. But I didn't because I don't like hitting girls, let alone killing them, and plus, I'm a nice guy like that, he berated the other brunette. Lee had to hold back the seething Kinoichi who was trying to lop off the blonde's head with his own sword. Naruto smirked. Just like you are now, he said. And while I'm on the subject, he began, I'll just go ahead and say it. You guys are inferior to me. He saw them flinched at his remark and decided to continue before they bombarded him with obscenities. Kiba, you're arrogant and overconfident in your abilities, which will get you killed one day. Tenten, you're a hothead and losing control like that will also get you killed. Lee, you would be an even better ninja if you knew some ninjutsu, which also happens to be your weakness. And last but not least, Yuniji are at least a worthy opponent. That calculating mind and that damnable gentle fist of yours are rather annoying to face. Unfortunately, I just outclass you. As much as either wanted to object, they couldn't. What he said was true. It was like being criticized by your sensei, only he was being about it. A smirk returned to Naruto's face. And by the way Kiba, the only reason I lost is because of Hinata. If she hadn't snuck up on me like that and distracted me, I would probably be miles away by now. None of them caught the look of the cherry-faced brunette walking ahead of them. Kiba was livid right now. Who the hell is this guy to come in berating the men act so high and mighty? Kakashi saw the unspoken question on Kiba's face and decided to speak up before the younger ninja did something stupid and attacked the helpless blonde. Naruto, what's become of you? You were never arrogant like this, Kakashi said. I'm not being arrogant Kakashi, I'm being truthful. I've trained rigorously with the Sanin for the last three years. I never I was all powerful, but they aren't good enough to beat me, Naruto said, his impassive mask returning to his face. Kakashi flinched when he heard his name said with such malice. This truly wasn't the same happy-go-lucky charge he trained years ago. But then something clicked in his mind. Trained with a Sanin. Tsunade was busy being Hokage, and Jiraiya has been searching for him. What do you mean you've trained with a Sanin for three years? You can't mean. Arachimaru Naruto finished for him. Bakashi was at a loss for words. Naruto, how could you? He's one of Konoha's greatest enemies. Naruto just remained silent and stared at the ground. Kakashi wasn't happy with not getting a response. Answer me. He uncharacteristically yelled. Naruto raised his head, with that same annoying uncaring expression, to meet his gaze. Don't feel like it, he said and went back to counting footprints left behind by Guy. The usually cool and laid-back silver-haired Jimin was losing his patience. Naruto, you will answer or, or what? Naruto interrupted. Kakashi stood there with his jaw hanging. He didn't have an answer. He was kinda just hoping he could win on intimidation, which clearly wasn't working out. Exactly. You leaf nin are all the same, Naruto said. You're leaf nin too Naruto. Kiba yelled. He was fed up with the blonde smug attitude. Was? I was a leaf nin. You guys branded me as a missing nin remember? Look, just get me to Konoha. The faster we get this over with, the faster I can go home, Naruto said in an annoyed tone. Home? You think we're just gonna let you run back to that snake bastard? Heh, you'll be lucky if Tsunade-sama ever lets you see the light of day again, Tenten smirked before going back to fondling Naruto's sword. Naruto ignored her and just kept his head down. We'll see about that Naruto thought as he began plotting his escape. Finally, after three long days of traveling, the gates of Konoha were finally in sight. The trip was long and tiresome, but their mission was a success. They even caught someone precious who had been missing for three years. Granted, after the events from a few days prior, not everyone was happy to see him. One thing Naruto was grateful for was that they were actually feeding him now. Turns out they forgot he was human and needed to eat like the rest of them. Unfortunately it took for him to be knocking on death's door from starvation for them to figure it out. Naruto was certain that it was a new method of torture engineered by Ibiki. That man truly was dastardly. Another thing he was grateful for was that they let him walk on his own again. His legs had fallen asleep from being hoisted over Guy's shoulder at the waist for hours. Things got a little awkward when Naruto got a full bladder and couldn't stand on his own feet. Kiba had been elected for the job, much to his displeasure, and came back red-faced and muttering about unfair gods and blessed men. Now they were all tiredly trudging down the dirt road that lead back to Kanahagakur. Yosh. We have finally made it home. Lee yelled excitedly as they approached the village's massive wooden gates, constructed by the first Hokage himself. Calm down Lee, it's not that exciting. It's the same, regular, boring old village that it was two weeks ago, Kiba said, trying to get the eccentric boy to calm down. But Kiba, we finally found Naruto-kun. I'm just happy that he's finally returning home after so long. Everyone will be so happy. Lee proclaimed, fist shaking. Heh, wouldn't be too sure about that, Tenten silently huffed as she sent a glare in the blonde's direction. Naruto was too busy trying to escape to care. But as he was plotting, something occurred to him. This was bound to happen. 
Someday, he was eventually going to run into his old friends and he'd have to confront them. Just cause it was going to happen doesn't mean that he was going to enjoy it. So his current plan was to get to the village, talk with the old hag, and swiftly escape and return home. Of course he was just gonna fly by the seat of his pants, but seeing as this whole situation was unexpected, it only seemed right. Unfortunately his partner in crime was still nowhere to be found, and this makes his escape even harder. He just kept plotting as he and his entourage casually slipped through customs and made their way to the Hokage's office. Sunaid was a nervous wreck right now. She had just received word from the main gate that the group from Suna had just arrived and had a certain missing nin with them. She hadn't believed it when Kakashi had sent her word from Suna a few days ago, but here he was, back in the village, on his way to her office right now. Allegedly. The whole thing just seemed all too real. First, Naruto just up and disappeared for the years, and Kakashi not only happens to stumble upon him on a mission, but also manages to capture him. Finally, after three long quiet years, the loud, knuckle-headed, hyperactive brat was back. Thus the thought of Naruto being safe and alive was enough to bring a smile to her face. She was so giddy with excitement that she almost didn't hear Shizune practically screaming at her. Tsunade sama Shizune screamed for like the third time. Huh? What? Tsunade responded dumbly. Is it true? Is he really Shizune asked. Tsunade smiled. If only the little brat actually knew just how many people cared for him. Shizune, go fetch Team 10 and Sakura. It's time for a long-awaited homecoming, Tsunade ordered, and Shizune was more than happy to oblige. Deep within the confines of the village rested Kanoha's prestige hot springs. It was midday and a number of women were taking this time to relax and enjoy themselves. Today was especially a good day since the world's biggest pervert wasn't in the village at the time, which meant they would be able to bathe in peace without having to worry about being spied on. If only they knew how wrong they were. Camped up in a tree sitting just outside the wall of the women's bath was the white-haired devil himself, equipped with a telescope and notepad. Gureya giggled perversely as he scribbled away on his tiny pad, taking very descriptive notes on the scene of younger women bouncing around and splashing water on each other. He didn't even care that he might die from the waterfall of blood that gushed from his nose. After all, what are blood transfusions for? Gureya heard tons of murmurs and looked up from his telescope toward a large crowd gathering around the perimeter of the main road. Curious as to what all the ruckus was about, he directed his instrument toward the mass of people and froze. He saw what, or more like who, the people were gaping at. Walking down the middle of the road, huddled in a group of ninjas led by Kakashi, was none other than his long-lost student. He tried lying to himself, saying that it was some random captive who just happened to have blonde hair, but the sapphire eyes and distinct whisker marks on his cheeks proved that it was indeed Naruto. Gureya sat there staring in disbelief. He was too shocked to care that his telescope slipped from his grasp and fell to the ground below. Can it be true? After all this time has Naruto finally returned? Jiraiya spoke aloud. He shot to his feet and rushed off in the direction of the academy. Tsunade must know something about this Jiraiya thought as he bounded across the village rooftops. Akashi was not comfortable with the current situation. He was trying to escort Naruto to the Hokage as casually and discreetly as possible, but judging from the amount of people watching, his plan failed miserably. As they walked down the streak, everyone, and I mean everyone, stopped what they were doing to stare at the as they passed by. Conversations between jovial adults died down and children about silenced their play and laughter. It didn't take long for whispers to arise from the gathering crowd. They had formed a circle around Naruto, just in case anyone still had any lingering grudges against the boy and decided to make an attempt on his life. Thankfully, noted. They just moved to the side of the road to clear the path and whispered among themselves. In fact, the only trouble, if you can call it that, they had was when Naruto abruptly stopped and looked toward the sky. He stared upwards like he was searching for something, but a quick shove from Kiba got him moving again. Kakashi let out a tired sigh as they continued their way towards the Hokage's office. He really hoped everything went smoothly so he could get a moment's rest. Unbeknownst to his captors, Naruto had an escape plan all figured out. He had sensed Leisho's just moments ago, but warned him to stay away. Naruto really didn't want to lay waste to Konoha if they hurt his dragon, but that's exactly what he'd do if they ever did. Instead, Leisho's would hover in the skies above the village and wait for his signal. He had to get this over with. The faster he put this behind him, the better. All that was left to do was to mentally prepare himself for the barrage of pleas begging him to stay, which definitely wasn't happening. Kanoha had their chance with. Twelve long years they had him and fucked up every last one of them. From now on, he looked out for himself now. After a strange and unexpected turn of events, he now had Sasuke, Kabuto, Orochimaru and Aleishos by his side. His small entourage was all he need. Of course, there was her too. Even though she greatly annoyed him to high heaven when they first met, she had she undoubtedly become an important person in his life, if not the most. 
He'd do anything, or at least damn well try to keep her happy. But then there was that thing with Hinata no. He couldn't. He had had to cut all ties with the leaf, friends included, even if that meant sacrificing a potential chance at happiness. Those feelings from earlier were a lapse on his part, and the whole hug ordeal left him confused. He wasn't used to being in such close contact with the opposite sex and didn't know how to react. After all, all his previous encounters left him with battered and bruised. Shaking those thoughts from his head, Naruto took in greater detail of his surrounding and saw that they were arriving at the academy building and his destination, the Hokage's office, resided within. Naruto paid no attention to the looks cast his direction as he was led through the administrative section of the academy. He just wanted to get this over with and get home as soon as possible. His wish was about to come true as he noticed they stopped in front of an ever so familiar oak door. The moment of truth was finally here. Kakashi turned to face the group to make sure everyone was ready. After getting an affirmative nod from everyone, Kakashi turned back to the door and took a deep breath. Exhaling calmly, he slowly opened the door before him and stepped into the office of the Hokage. Sakura was waiting idly in Tsunade's office. When she had arrived, she noticed that Ino, Shikamaru, Chijai, and their sensei Asuma was there as well. She asked her sensei why she had been called and had only been told for a long-awaited homecoming. She knew about how Kakashi teammate and Guy's team set out for a mission in Suna nearly two weeks ago and figured that they were who she was referring to. But why would their homecoming be long-awaited? Ninja tend to leave for mission for months at a time but never received a homecoming from the Hokage herself. Maybe it was a really important mission. She couldn't come with any viable clues. She took this time to analyze the room's other occupants. Shizun stood next to Tsunade's desk and looked like she was about to explode from happiness any minute now. Tsunade was sitting calmly at her desk wearing a smile, something she wasn't seen too often doing. Team 10 were going through their usual antics. Chimjai munching on chips, Shikamaru lazily gazing at the clouds while trying to tone out Ino, who was berating him on being so lethargic. And of course Asuma just silently puffed away on a cigarette. Sakura had been here for almost 10 minutes now and was just fed up with waiting. Tsunade Sama, how much longer will this take? I wasn't finished training, Sakura asked. Naruto and Sasuke weren't going to save themselves after all. Tsunade looked up from her thoughts at hearing her name and saw her students standing before her. Not much longer Sakura, they should be here any minute now. And you shouldn't push yourself so much with training or else you'll end up doing more harm than good. She answered. But I have to get stronger Tsunade Sama. I have to save them Sakura said glumly. Tsunade had been worried about her apprentice. She spent unhealthy amounts of hours of training, all for the sake of saving her lost teammates. Hopefully, after today, all of that would change. Sakura just trust me. After today, give or take three or four days, everything will be fine and hopefully back to normal, Tsunade said softly with a smile. Sakura was confused and wanted to question what she meant by that, but never got the chance, as she heard the sound of a knob turning and the office door opening. She watched as Kakashi, teammate, and team guy filed into the room. They all looked tired and worn out, most likely from the long journey. But there was another person amongst them. He was rather tall and wore black clothing, a large red coat was wrapped around his lower body and was held in place by an orange rope-like belt. His head was covered in a mop of spiky blonde hair. After further analysis of his looks, she saw his ocean blue eye and the three whisker-like marks on his cheeks. That's when something in her mind clicked. Only one person in the whole world fit that description. Sakura stiffened and her mouth hung as she gaped at the boy before her. Tsunade sat quietly with her chin resting on her intertwined hands as she listened intently to Kakashi's mission report. Truthfully, she didn't give a damn what happened just as long as the mission was a success and everyone returned home safely and unharmed. She just wanted to hear exactly how they ran into Naruto and managed to capture him. She was happy to see that he was alive and appeared to be in good health. She decided to tune back into Kakashi before Shizun caught on to her. That's when Naruto intervened and saved both Kiba and I. Everyone else arrived a few minutes later, and after Naruto stated that he would not return to the village, Kiba, Tenten, Lee, and Niji engaged him in battle. Naruto overpowered them and nearly escaped until Hinata immobilized him, and Niji knocked him out. We stayed in Suna for a week to recuperate before setting out for Konoha, Kakashi finished. He had a strange feeling that she hadn't been listening the entire time. Tsunade glanced over the group that had just arrived in her office. The four previously mentioned had downcast looks on their faces, while Hinata was slightly pink. Kurinai and amazingly, Guy stood in silence. And finally, there was Naruto. His gaze was locked on some unknown spot in front of her desk, and his face was expressionless. She didn't believe that he had been able to make short work of four promising shinobi, but when she factored in that he was the most unpredictable ninja she'd ever met and the strange aura of power that he radiated, it seemed possible. Tsunade had pondered this moment many times in the past. What she would say when she finally saw him again. 
Unfortunately, this wasn't one of the circumstances she had predicted. He was in front of her, bound and chained, and it was obvious from the distant look on his face that he didn't want to be there. Her heart nearly broke at hearing that he never wanted to return to the village. She didn't want to believe it, but she would find out for herself here and now. Naruto stood quietly in the middle of the large office, which seemed a lot smaller with a large number of people there. He honed in on a weird pattern at the base of Tsunade's wooden desk. Even though he couldn't see them, he could feel the stares that fell on him. The last one he had seen was Sakura's look of total shock and disbelief. He continued to stand silently, eyes still locked on that swirl pattern in the wood, as Kakashi gave his report. It was only a matter of time till he was addressed. He just had to get this quick chat over with, get his sword back from Tenten, outrun the entire village's shinobi force, and escape the village with Leishos. Easy enough right. Naruto. Naruto looked up at hearing his name and was face to face with the Hokage. Her pleading honey orbs locked with his impassive cerulean ones. My, you've gone and gotten tall on me, Tsunade smiled, just noticing that he had few inches on her. She was trying to break the ice seeing they hadn't spoken in years. Amazing right? Who would have thought it possible, especially after all those years starving stunting my growth, Naruto said sarcastically, the slightest hint of venom hidden in his voice. The tension in the room grew slightly. It nearly pained Tsunade hear this, but she decided to brush it off. She wouldn't lose her resolve. So tell me Naruto, how have you been all these years? She asked. Alive, Naruto replied flatly. Tsunade sighed. He sure was making it difficult to keep up a civil conversation. Can you at least tell me where you've been all this time? What happened three years ago? She asked. Her question was never graced with an answer. Tsunade was beginning to lose patience with the boy. She was about to ask another question, but Kakashi spoke first. Forgive me for interrupting Hokage-sama, but I reason to believe that Naruto, along with Sasuke, has been with Orochimaru. It would seem that he has been trained by him as well, the Cyclops Jumnin interjected. Tsunade turned back to Naruto with a look of horror on her face. Naruto is that true? She asked disbelievingly. An annoyed sigh escaped the younger blonde. Thanks to Kakashi snitching on him, he'd have to tell the story of his disappearance. So what if it is? Why does it matter to you anyway? Naruto responded. Naruto, of all people why him? Would you run away? Tsunade nearly yelled. I didn't run away and I didn't go to him by choice. Naruto said sharply, making her flinch at the tone of his voice. The rest of the room was silent as they listened to the two blondes' converse. What do you mean? Tsunade queried. After Sasuke and I fraud at the Valley of the End, I was left unconscious. Sasuke took it upon himself to carry me with him to Orochimaru. I awoke later bound to a bed and was told I couldn't leave. A spark of hope welled up in Tsunade. This proved that he didn't leave willingly. There was still a chance for him. But you're here now. You can return to the village and I can have you reinstated and- Not happening, Naruto interrupted. What are you talking about Naruto? Tsunade asked. She really hoped Kakashi was lying about what he said earlier. I'm not staying in Konoha. They're the reason I led a troubled life. Why would I return to the place that ostracized me as a child for something beyond my control? They even tried to kill me. They wanted me gone so that's exactly what I'm going to do. Disappear. But it's not like that anymore Naruto. Your father was the fourth right. Naruto interrupted her again. Tsunade was shocked. How did he know about his heritage? Naruto decided to continue, seeing Tsunade was a loss for words. You know I didn't believe it when Kiba told me, but seeing the look on your face must mean it's true. If that's the case, I'm definitely not returning. I don't want people suddenly kissing my ass just because of who my father was, and he can burn in hell for all I care. If it wasn't for him, this would have never happened in the first place. As soon as Naruto finished, the sound of a smack echoed around the room. Everyone turned to see a teary-eyed Sakura and Naruto with a red cheek. Why why are you being like this? You're not the same Naruto as before. What's happened to you? Answer me. Sakura pleaded. Naruto just looked down at her. He had lasted a lot longer before snapping than he originally thought. Same old Sakura, hit first, ask questions later, Naruto said looking down at the pinkette. You know, you're right. I'm not the same Naruto as before. The old me used to follow you around like a lost puppy, begging for even the slightest hint of acknowledgement from you. He would have gone through hell and high water, probably even given his life for you. And you know what he got in return? Naruto asked. Seeing her face tear up again instead of responding, Naruto decided to continue. He got your hated. Your absolute scorn Sakura. Whether it was a smack for being dimwitted or a total beatdown as an outlet for your anger. But no matter how much you vilified him, he kept coming back for more. Well guess what? That Naruto died long ago when he became a missing nin, Naruto said harshly. He didn't show the slightest bit of remorse, even as tears streaked down her face. Naruto I'm sorry, Sakura said weakly. Save it, Naruto said sharply. I don't want your apologies. Naruto noticed the position of the sun outside the window. 
if he was right, it was around 2 pm, and if he left now, he would be able to make it back to the sound by late evening. So you're not going to stay Naruto? Tsunade asked in her hokage voice. If he was adamant in his stature then she would have to throw him in jail. He had already been gone for such a long time, and it would pain her to lock him away as soon as he returned. She really hoped it wouldn't come to that. I've spent too much time here as it is. Time for me to go, Naruto said flatly. Tsunade raised an eyebrow. Even if he had gotten stronger, there was no way in hell he could best herself, forge Nin, Tench Nin, outrun every shinobi in the village, escape, and have the energy to make it back to Orochimaru. Unpredictable as he is, it still just wasn't possible. That was a bet she'd be more than willing to make. Just as Tsunade was about to respond, Naruto let out a sharp high-pitched whistle. Everyone immediately became defensive and turned to the captive blonde, waiting for him to act. But he never did. Instead, there was a bright flash outside that flooded the entire room with light right before the windows exploded. The explosion sent everyone in a 100-meter radius into a frenzy. Anbu immediately swarmed the rubble of their leader's office to find her and the other occupant banged up, but otherwise alright. Tsunade pushed some debris aside and coughed as she stood back on her feet. That explosion had caught everyone, including herself off guard, and it left her ears ringing. She didn't know what caused it, but whatever it was, it sure was powerful. The thought of Naruto wielding such a power sent chills up her spine. After a few moments, the ringing in her ears subsided and she was able to focus. She was happy to see that everyone else was safe and sound, but realized they were short one person. She whirled around and snapped her gaze to the nearest Anbu she could find. Naruto has escaped. I want the entire village and the surrounding woods thoroughly search from top to bottom. Do not let him escape. Tsunade barked out the orders. Yes, ma'am. The Anbu saluted before disappearing from sight. Hearing a couple moans and groans behind her, Tsunade cursed her luck once again, before going to heal any bumps and bruises anyone sustained. What if Kanoha begs Naruto to return harem? Thanks for watching my video till the end if you enjoy this content, then do consider subscribing to my channel, and leave a like if you guys need the next part, comment down, and thanks for watching the video and see you guys in the next video.